All right, let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new conference. I hope you are all fine. Um, I think I got COVID, but it's fine. Fully vaccinated here. I only got COVID several times. So that should be good. Uh, this is a French conference I'll be doing, um, and uh, I'm going to do this in English too because I usually record my conferences in English and French too. We're gonna speak about a few things that um, are responsibility, digital responsibility in particular, and we're going to be speaking about planetary boundaries. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to talk about digital, we're going to talk about um, limitations to our systems. Um, this, is con this is a conference that is, um, let's say, about two-thirds um, of a general conference I could give to anyone, and the last third of a conference um, would be typically to uh, the people who are concerned about what the digital part is about in all this problem and what you should do um, from it. So let's go. Um, so in short, we are going to, um, let's say, review a few things like discuss about a little scientific knowledge first, talk about our systemics. Earth ecology, and then we're going to speak about eco strategy, eco implementation, and eco design. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, ecology, which comes from um, oikos in Greek and logos. Uh, oikos is the house, and logos means the science, the thing where you, you study something. Um, eco strategy is how your structures should be um, behavior, behaving, you know against what has already begun to strike us as humanity. Uh, in implementation means um, implementing solutions that are technically less violent for biosphere and eco-conception uh, means thinking um, information systems, action services and uh, digital goods. So you think usually when you um, attend this kind of conference that you're going to talk about the three ones on the top um, that I'm going to give you a lot of tips and stuff but the thing is we are actually going to be talking way much more about the last ones um, I think you're going to understand by yourselves why uh, and in the end when this conference is over you will know why we discussed um, way much more about whatever is on the bottom here as it is really, really more important. So before we start, um, a little uh, introductory warning. Um, I am not an engineer uh, in the sector of energy, of materials. Um, I'm not um, a scientist by will, you know, I'm not a, a researcher, I'm not anything into the sectors. So whatever you're going to hear it, whatever I'm going to say, you will have to check it, source it uh, by yourselves and only trust me um, from the time I'm going to make this talk with you. Um, and also because due to the stakes, the high stakes we have today, uh, the whole world is moving very, very fast on all these um, topics. So second stuff that I'm, I have to tell you, uh, the first part of what I'm going to describe to you is extremely um, sad and appalling regarding whatever humanity is going to. It should be even traumatizing for some people. So, as I've already seen lots of people reacting pretty bad, especially when things go fast, um, I'm pretty fond of, you know, um, um, electrical shock uh, mentally uh, to people, so that then you get the time to give people a second electrical shock that is a positive one to uh, help them recover and um, stimulate the energy of people and how they could um, think about the things and stuff. So uh, not everything is dark, not everything is black and the night is not coming to us that fast. I don't have the time right now to um, spend like these hours I would need on consequences, on acting, on resiliency, and on politics, economy, or how to reinvent the world, but uh, that could be 
a whole other topic by itself after that. So if you have, if you're already going through a bad day, I just suggest that you just um, pause this video and um, come back later on. <laughs> I won't be pouting. Um, so three key points of what we're going to talk about today. The first thing is we are in fact facing the hardest and the largest meta problem that um, mankind ever has to, ha to to face and to solve. Um, and we're gonna speak a little about physics. Um, second point, for that you need to understand the underlying problematics uh, that are linked to, to biocapacity and to planetary boundaries. And um, because I have to <laughs> speak about digital in particular, I'm gonna make a focus on digital, but um, if they want it to be true, it would actually be less than 5% of this conference length. So I'm going to spend more than this, but it's just on purpose. So first of all things, my name is William Pino. Um, when people ask me what I do, I say that I'm Web Ninja. Uh, I've been working in IT for 15 years, four years with a company named New South and um, co-ambassador of digital responsibility. And I'm also a pastime teacher uh, at University of Limoges, but I don't speak, of course, in the name of any of the structures. They just, um, the places I work to. And of course, I'm connected. I do lots of stuff. I'm a musician, photographer. I do online conferences like this one, and I play like way too much too, so you can find me on lots of networks. So yeah, if you're still here, um, I'm going to try a challenge. Um, I'm going to condense what I can easily explain in 60 hours with a, an average of 60 minutes per topic, which is going to be two or three hours long for this conference. So um, if you want to have a, um, how to say, uh, if you want to know how broad and how large it can be, um, I'm going to uh, tell you, to warn you that uh, in an order of magnitude, um, if I wanted to be discussing every topics here, uh, if you wanted to be fully trained as citizens and trying to start acting against what's in, in, in this talk, the subject of this talk, uh, you should be trained uh, from around 1 and 50, 150 hours to 200 hours. It's no joke. This is whatever human needs to be able to fully um, participate and act in that. So I only got a few hours left here. So I'm just going to give you a few keys and incite you, entice you to um, understand by yourselves because whatever is, uh, quotes me, uh, ready to think is not a good thing. So I want you to just um, be stimulated and um, find the rest by yourself. So first things first, yeah, let's go. We, it, we, we need to realize um, what we are, where we come from, and rewind uh, the tape, the movie tape a little one. When I say rewind, I'm just going to rewind like a lot. Something like 14 million years ago, a billion years ago, um, our universe was extremely stable, um, dense, and hot. Um, so much that the notion of space, time, and matter probably didn't exist. Um, exactly like the way we, com we we conceive them today. So at some point of quantic fluctuations suddenly made everything um, delayed, you know, and uh, expand. And points of energy and matter were um, dispersed, scattered all around the universe and spreading towards something that should be infinite. This sudden spread this sudden inflation created stars um, everywhere almost everywhere um, by matter um, accretion I think that's uh, the English words yeah accretion and uh, the stars depending on their size um, have been fabricating making different components of matter uh, that we know today uh, including you um, and whatever you're made of namely the atoms and a couple of things we know less like antimatter dark matter dark energy that will be for another time um, depending on the size just remember that depending on the size uh, the stars are more or less complex like when the stars become larger they create larger um, 
elements by fusioning them up to something like iron usually and when they just um, uh, collapse and explode uh, they burst into so much energy that they fabricate the rest of the elements that we know and this matter is mostly constituted from elementary particles that are really not that numerous if you are afraid of the Mendeleev table this is way easier to remember you know up down chump stretch top bottom and that's it you basically describe the matter uh, the fermions, um, you got quarks and you got leptons. Uh, you are mostly familiar with the electron, but the others exist too. And um, if you just remember up, down, and electron, you know mostly everything about matter that we need to know for this talk at least. Um, and uh, usually, this is matter, the, the the things that compose matter. And then you got the um, interaction bosons um and th this these force carriers um they they represent each of them represent uh, a force interaction which is when in physics anything is happening uh generally we just emit this kind of bosons depending on the interaction type so you got usually the um electromagnetic interaction which is mostly represented by photon here then you've got the strong interaction and the weak interaction with three bosons w plus w minus and z um, and uh, this is not the gravity boson as we know it there should be a gravity boson we think there is one but we haven't found it yet um, and with all those particles if you just remember pick it up up down an electron you would actually create what is called here, for example, a neutron. If you just put an up, down, and down quark, you just got a neutron. If you just put up, up, and down, you got a, um, a photon. All right. So within all this, you can actually create an atom. This is a very bad representation of what is an atom, but it's just uh, symbolic, so you understand. So this is electrically charged positive, so you need to compensate with electrons. So usually those charges are... Um, annihilated because they, uh, they they negate each other so they are neutral and the neutrons have no um, charge so with that base we can create atoms like this helium atom for example and with atoms we can create more bodies more chemical bodies simple complex uh, metal uh, alloys um, simple molecules complex molecules etc so this is just whatever we think when we think about energy and matter uh, in the sense that we just use every day and you see that these are very intrinsically um, tied to each other and like i said the four interaction um, forces are making this come all together or uh, ensuring the cohesion of uh, the nucleus and stuff so that's a lot of things but this is what we are going to talk about in this presentation when we think about matter and energy all right so as far as we can right now we haven't perceived the boundaries the limits of our universe provided there are limits there should be no limits but we truth energy, we find energy and matter all around. This is us in the middle, this is everything we can see all around us. What we called um, the... Um, I just forgot, the, the cosmological horizon yeah, um, of what we see, what we perceive is consensually uh, 45 billion light years diameter wide. And we can distinguish far beyond what our eyes can see um, meter heaps of galaxies what we call supercluster and um, this is where is located our supercluster that the one we call Lainiakea it means uh, immeasurable heaven in Hawaiian so um, just for the pleasure of the eyes um, this is a video made by uh, nature uh, and uh, it's a complement to the article that uh, they hosted since 2014 when they first materialized this modelization of Lanyak here. Uh, each dot that you see here is a, a huge heap of galaxies. It's billions of galaxies. And 
uh, the, the, the point you see in the middle where everything is going here, as you see, is named the Great Attractor. If you are afraid of black holes, uh, don't even imagine what this thing is. <laughs> I really, really, really incite you to go watch this video without crying because it's a really beautiful video um, just for, just, you know, to understand the scale effects. So, um, um, let's let's just um, go to the next place in, in the super cluster we're talking about. We found what we call a local group, a local group of something like 60 galaxies and uh, billions of heaps of this matter. Uh, propelled by stars, who just uh, which just um, aggregate by gravity, um, that forming concretions, asteroids, um, gas heaps, solids, um, planets, etc. And our galaxy, we called it uh, the Milky Way, just because we want it to be nice. You know, it's a reference to what we see in the sky. It looks like milk spread in the sky. It's made of hundreds of billions of planets and stars uh, an average size galaxy actually and on the orion spur here um, there's a planetary system we called the solar system and the sun our star like we just say um, does not escape this whole star rule and was constituted by, by um, dust and gas primal dust and gas that just collapsed on themselves um, and it absorbs 99.8% of the matter of the solar system which means as of today um, it's a collapsing stars uh, and uh, sun represents 99.99% of the energy that is coming to the surface of earth you know so it's permanently um, fusing uh, it's trying to melt um, hydrogen into helium and then break it backwards so it's it's uh, manipulating 620 million tons of helium per second and earth um, just the rest did the same thing but in lesser proportions and it was constituted just like most planet from uh, environmental matter you know that was in the space around and that just collapsed with gravity on itself and it was not always um, a place you could live you know far from it <laughs> and if you think about the first eons uh, which are meta epochs uh, in terms of geology uh, like the Hadean and Nokian um, you see this being reconstituted um, pictures of earth as is it is thought to be um, to have been like billion of years ago you see um, it was only a, a couple hundreds of millions of years after Earth formed so yeah it was not really easy to live in and on the surface because our Earth is still six uh, six thousand four hundred um, kilometers um, radius wide uh, we find water uh, we still have not a complete picture of where water comes from you have three or four different um, possible theories and that could have been present in the in the dust but um put uh under shelter from the sunlight and could have been coming from other planets and stuff uh, lots of things to say about this one but what we know is that there was water on the surface and this water through um a cyclic erosion phenomenon which is um hydrometeors falling uh hitting on the floor um silicated um uh, tetrahedr tetrahedrons, I think it's named. Uh, I just wanted to check. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just translating from French on the side. Yeah, it's tetrahedron. So it's uh, heating on surface, um, silicated tetrahedrons. You know, because um, the 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 outside, the crust is mostly made from oxygen and silicon, and it just breaks those soils and it creates uh, clays, and all of this is done, as we have seen, by the energy of the sun hitting the surface of the planet. So it's the power of energy on matter. That's what energy does. Energy is used to transform a system, a physics system, into a different state. And that's what it does uh, when it manipulates water, when water evaporates and then condensates and falls back on Earth and actually breaks uh, the rocks on the surface. And the energy that we have come from the sun, have received every time, 
is enough so that following those events, those simple molecules have continuously been recomposing to form other molecules non-stop. They were hit all the time by external elements. And that's what, again, energy does to matter. It transforms it. And at random, but there's a billions, there are billions of possibilities of molecular combinations. So at some point, we have formed more complex molecules that we call polymerization. And the thing is, polymerization allows us to obtain the first prebiotic synthesis here, which is very complex um, molecules slowly being assembled through polymerization into something that was a protocellular, um, how to say, so prototype, you see? So natural prototype, but at some point, it just created what we call life and it still goes on. It will never stop until the sun is burning the earth, which is going to happen in a few billions of years if it doesn't collapse until then. So it does that all the time uh, to point like elements like uh, ionizing uh, radiation, um, ultraviolet, uh, chemical elements. Uh, just perturbate these great molecules all the time. And among this, they do hit and perturbate and break and crack the molecule that is responsible for genetic memory transmission, which is DNA. And the absolute and crushing majority of time, those modifications don't make anything useful, like uh, this rabbit, for example, you see the lab rabbits are living in the snow and the snow somehow created a brown rabbit, but you can reproduce and uh, there will be half genetics from white and brown. But at some point, a predator comes in and the thing is, you can be very fast. Even if you're the fastest rabbit in the galaxy, you will not escape the predator on snow because you are not white and they cannot see you. So in the end, uh, you created a small mix, a small generation mix and thing. Um, so most of the time, the modifications that are induced to DNA are actually not productive. They don't do anything useful. And most of the time, actually, they create deadly modifications. Um, and sometimes, very rarely, a step inward, a beneficial mutation. And this mutation gives an advantage and after reproducing, it creates a natural selection mechanism. And that's how life developed on a very fragile ecosystem. Why is it fragile? Because it depends on a grain of dust, you know, a mod of dust that is earth. But also, it also relies on any previous mutation from the environment. And when you start having heterotrophs, which is, uh, which are um, entities, genetic and genetically viable entities, biological entities that feed that trophy on other entities, they depend on them like we do. And if anything that you need to survive disappears, you disappear too, on turn. And that's exactly uh, what all the animals are, and this is a timeline of what different um, super types of animals we have seen. And fatally, us, Homo sapiens, out there, um, we have a particularity that is a notable um, difference from lots of animals, most of them actually. Uh, a remarkable encephalization, what is called the neocortex that allows us to do several things like learn, transmit, and go faster than genetic memory. This is very important. Thanks to that, we develop language, we develop communication, education, and we are going faster with transmitting um, what we learn and what we know from the past. We are storing this outside DNA and we are using non-DNA um, organs related to that you know we can speak we can hear we can write down things uh, we have developed ways of going way further and faster than genetic natural mutation and evolution can do and among other things it made us conscious 
conscious of our mortality and conscious of a lot of things. So we understood and we are conscious of what being alive means and what dying means. So we tried to go against that. First because we found things at random and then because we understood slowly that it was in our interest to understand our environment. And to do that, to do so, to achieve so, we just um, used and we use, we are currently using the whole bunch of resources we have at disposal on the planet. Um, just not only what we are genetically made from, including things that could be completely toxic and deadly to us, we are using everything. You know, just like iridium, just like oil or gamma radiation, we are using everything we can. When I mean everything, it's everything. On this quasi-sphere, quasi-bowl here, everything we have at disposal, within range, we are using everything. Because outside of it, there is nothing. We just know there's void and nothing is alive, nothing is going to help as far as we could reach and we have reached already very far. The anthroposphere crossing the biosphere, it's a very, um, to, to describe it, uh, it's a very uh, thin, a very extremely thin pellicle um, on the surface of the Earth. What, what I just use as an image to better understand that is usually um, a silicon layer on the surface of a basketball. By the way, I really recommend that you read again uh, the speech from Carl Sagan, the astrophysician, that is called Pale Blue Dot from 1994. So, what we just see, and more or less, depending on Frank Drake's equation, uh, corrected by Sarah Seeger a couple of years ago, we would only have 0 0.45 inhabitable planet with a currently equivalent civilization, a contemporary one, inside our galaxy, able to communicate with us, and it's already more than probably out of reach even if you just wanted to reach the hundredth on the distance that separates us so yes everything is on earth when your eyes are going up there you know when you're going looking up um, humanity has successfully managed to go uh, using uh, the, the, via the Apollo 13 mission uh, up to 140,000 kilometers away from its inhabitation um, location. Uh, and this, the, the Voyager 1 probe, uh, launched 37 years ago, is actually our most distant, our currently most distant object. It's 23.6 billion kilometers away from Earth. You can track this live on the NASA website. When going down, um, mankind has successfully descended, went down up to four kilometers under the ground. Uh, here in the deepest mine in the world, uh, which is exactly right now, as moment of speaking, four kilometers in a gold mine. Uh, that you should see what it is like. There are huge venting towers on the surface to just help the people survive inside it, and you need several hours to go down to the bottom of this mine. And um, if you just want to speak about drill holes, we have um, sent robots up and down to, uh, to uh, 10,911 meters um, under the ocean in the Marina Trench and 12 kilometers and 262, not 26, because this is already a couple of meters under the surface, on the peninsula of Kola in Russia. That is now collapsed. They, they just drilled down there and they found out that the heat and temperature and pressure were just way enough, so they stopped it. In terms of speed, if we just wanted to go like the furthest ahead and faster away, so the fastest object we have ever designed as humanity uh, was the Parker probe, and it's still active, by the way, um, that just really, really, really... Um, really grazed really just uh it just went very <clears throat> very close to the sun 
8 million kilometers away from the sun is real, real close from the sun. And the speed was 532,000 kilometers per hour, which is approximately one out of 2,028 of the speed of light in the void. I hope you can realize how fast this probe has been. It needed to go that fast and take speed around um, planets or our solar system but because it has a heat shield on the front but it already reached 1800 degrees uh, celsius so it's really really hot but that is the fastest we have done and achieved so far so in short if i wanted to summarize we are living in a complex system that we call the earth system which consists of a very superficial layer very thin layer of a couple tenths of kilometer uh, thick on the surface. That is all we have at disposal. So when I say use everything on Earth, when I say mankind uses everything on Earth, it just decomposes in mainly four types of resources. So first of all, the irreversible resources, like breaking the uranium-235 um, atom, for civil nuclear fusion, uh, which we can reconstitute, we can synthesize this back again, but the cost is really too high and we are losing energy on that. Or, simply put, the energy of the sun that bounces on Earth happily for us because otherwise temperature will increase non-stop to, towards infinity, and so are all the debris, all the space things we have sent around the planet and on Mars and further that we'll never get back if they don't fall back on Earth and they are precious and they are lost. Or simply put, whatever is extracted from the ground and that's never used again or just not recycled again. All right, so those are the type of irreversible resources. The second type of resources are those that are not highly renewable enough, which is the case of the three fossil energies uh, like oil, gas and coal. Um, coal, fossil coal, uh, essentially formed on the continents something like 300 million years ago uh, during the Carbonifer um, period, which of course bears his name from it. And oil uh, formed uh, a few liters per year underground. Uh, via sedimentation, ocean oceanic sedimentation and um, plate tectonics, you know, so we are actually consuming 101 millions of barrels of 159 liters per day, which is 1,800, uh, uh, sorry, 180,000 liters per second of oil. I'm going to repeat that because really we need to understand how much it is. We are using right now on the planet all the time, perpetuously, 180,000 liters per second. This is the order of magnitude of what we're doing. And fossil gas uh, is often found with those, uh, the two previous ones, uh, the two la related to. Um, most, sometimes it's found alone, uh, but it's, let's just be making sure it's mostly when coal and oil are um, buried a little further uh, into more extreme temperature and pressure conditions uh, is where gas, natural gas, uh, forms, fossil gas. So remember, three to four hundred millions of years to form and we will have grilled, burned and used everything within 30, uh, let's say, let's say 300 years, all right? That, that's the difference. We have used all of this within 300 years, most of it, like 90% of it. And it will just have taken a few millions of years to barely form. So then are the um, highly renewable sources, which is, uh, the, the, these are the, the resources that are renewable at our scale, uh, essentially, what if there is living that will die? Moss, uh, lichens, algae, uh, animals, uh, vegetables, the blob, whatever you want it to be. So it's mostly uh, wood, um, it's uh, 
used water, uh, ethanol, um, biomass in the general sense. And then what are called the constant resources. Um, usually when you speak about energy, civil energy, we just call them renewable energies. Um, they're not really renewable, they're just perpetual, they're just constant. Um, they are to be considered infinite to the scale of mankind because uh, we still have a few, a couple, uh, tens of billions of years ahead of us. So first of all, uh, the cosmologic uh, macro background, uh, which is the greatest source of energy in the universe, keeping it from the absolute zero, but it's so diffuse that we cannot exploit it. Uh, then we got gravity. Um, which is, for example, uh, when allied to chemical properties of water, um, creates hydro energy, hydro energy uh, from fresh water, land water, or um, sea water, ocean water. Then we also got uh, geothermal energy, which is uh, coming from the heat from the underground, which is uh, itself in turn coming from disintegration of uh, radioactive disintegration of uh, the earth mantle. Uh, then we have the main source of energy which is uh, solar energy um, and it's actually what we use the most. Like I said it's 99.99% of whatever energy comes at the surface of the planet um, yearly and uh, it just to give you um, how much energy this makes the whole, um, the, the whole complete total of energy used by humanity in one year, the yearly used consumed energy of humanity uh, is sent by the sun on earth within one hour. This is how powerful it is. And so by extent, um, this induces a temperature differential in the gas formed atmosphere so it creates winds and we have energy from um, fluid thermodynamics and those two energies are fatal because we don't choose them when they come or when they don't happen they are intermittent okay they are somehow foreseeable like the the tides the sea tides are really easy to forecast we can get exactly how they are going to be for hundreds of years ahead of us um, wind we don't have that much we can uh, forecast how like the wind is going to be for a couple hours or days at best and same goes for um light we know exactly when light is going to hit which part of the planet but we don't know how much light will reach from the sun towards the surface because of lots of things in the atmosphere in between all right so uh, th this creates um a, a very um a very different uh consideration for all this energy so these intermittent energies are really really powerful but harder to exploit and our use of energy content, uh, contained in these atoms or molecules when it's within atoms we speak of nuclear because it comes from nucleus in latin which is the uh, the, the 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 center of the core um, and or sometimes coming from the associations the working together of atoms what we call molecules, like um, like when we, you have uh, several uh, several atoms working all together, you have what we call redox. You have studied this in college usually, and uh, redox is what you do oxido uh, oxidization and reduction. Redox is what you do with wood, with gas, with oil, um, and it's basically what we do with energy today. And our use, as you can see on this graph, is phenomenally growing it's exploding this is a scale that is beyond everything just look in within one century starting here to here how much we exploded this energy use so this is the primary energy consumption which means it's whatever you take in the environment all right and this is how it is uh, scattered and dispatched through time 
So you see you have biomass first, which is in majority wood being burnt. Uh, then you have coal, then you have um, oil, and then um, fossil fuel, fossil gas, natural gas, uh, and then small stuff, you have like nuclear energy, hydro power, hydroelectricity, uh, hydropower means um, raw power, mechanical power, and sometimes hydroelectricity. Uh, and then you have um, thermal solar energy, which is uh, sun heating panels mostly, but not necessarily photovoltaics. And then you have uh, bio biofuels here on the very, very top that you cannot barely see. And, and other renewables, uh, including um, some very rare things that we don't use today a, a lot. So if you look at this, you have 77% fossil energy. 84% are really highly carbon emitting. And 83% of them are actually strictly not renewables at all scale. So actually, when you look at it, we just produce electricity, we just display stuff, and then we just heat stuff and lots of other things. That's basically what we do with that. And it's a funny thing that if you just measure the activity of a country um, according to, this, to its use of energy, the correlation between both metrics is absolutely phenomenal. No, please not. These are logarithmic scales on both sides, scale X and Y. Uh, if, I, if we just put this on a um, regular scale, this would just be uh, a straight line. All right. So, as you can see, GDP is actually a factor and a di direct consequence of energy consumption. And because boundaries and frontiers are uh, useless, Let's just see uh, on the macro scale, according to time, what it does. I think this is way clearer that it's never been. The direct and natural correlation between the energy use and the GDP. This is worldwide. All right. This is what I would call close to a straight line. You can see the, the R2 factor is really cons confident here. But it doesn't stop here. We talked about energy, but matter is the same problem. This is the Mendeleev um, elements uh, table in a contemporary version. We, we should be remembering that from your childhood lessons. Uh, I know you were sleeping next to the heater, but we have commonly accepted three types of elements. We have metals here on the left. We have non-metals here and some stuff that is more or less acting um, like a metal or not metal, which is usually semiconductors, and um, we call them mesaloids, all right? Depends on lots of properties that these things are, depends on um, electricity, conduction, malleability, lots of things. And, that, and, and, and that same thing is just uh, mind-blowing. We just use all of these elements, all of them, to do so many things you don't even have an idea of. And most of them, are mostly vital stuff. So once again, if I just put some GDP here on a scale and we talk about the metabolic rate of these resources, you see, which is all resources now, mineral resources, oil, fuse, everything at the same time. I think it is clear. Again, look at the scale. It's a logarithmic scale, but what it would still be a straight line. And you see the highest GDP countries here, always on the top and lowest here. You can see again that your richness, your ease of use, your ease of living is depending on your metabolic rate, on the tons per capita per year that you're using. You see, that's a high correlation. Your life, as you conceive it today, depends on what you do with matter and energy. If you just look globally, it just raises all the time all the time, all the resources time, and it's raising, raising and raising. It's on the rise perpetually. It's not only chemical elements alone, but also larger molecules like materials, like sand. Good quality sand is already facing a huge crisis worldwide. And if you look, uh, we are still doing the same things. We are using this to create home and to heat. We're making buildings. We are making products and blah, 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 etc. So there's a problem with that. The consequence of this use and the reason for all of this in the same time. In 2021, 
an average human being consumed over 22 gigawatts hour per year on an average. It raises up and goes up to 182 in Qatar, 107 in Iceland, 75 USA. Those are the top consuming countries. But a human person that really slept and ate correctly used at the maximum of its possibilities. I'm, I'm meaning the maximum. I'm not talking about um, easy things like four hours of CrossFit or uh, 500 meters uh, differential uh, hiking. No, 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 no. I, I mean, you would just do this four times a day, 20 to 16 hours of the hardest work your muscles can produce per day. In other terms, if you, do, if you were to do this over a month, you will be probably dead right? Your body wouldn't be able to bear it. If you were working this much and producing that much energy, you would be creating no more than 100 kilometers, uh, kilowatts hours per year per human. Which means in the world right now, a human, an average human person can at best, if we were to all together work our asses off we could just produce 0.4 percent the energy of the energy that we use that we consume this falls down to 0.2 percent in france england germany 0.1 in usa this is the reality of what we do today and all that comes from the fact that these energy sources that we have seen we cannot metabolize them directly you don't eat Oil. You don't make a car called uh, pie and just eat it and be like, mm, this is good. But the machines we have created, they do use these fuels directly. As a consequence, our social models have been completely uh, overwhelmed. Um, they have been completely shaken over the last 300 years. Here, for instance, you see the number, the number of annual working hours. In other terms, in all the countries, especially the rich ones, the more time passes, the less the human people work and the more the machine work for us. Same thing, if you were to compare the productivity, uh, the number of hours, the output per hour worked, uh, towards the annual working hours, you would just see as just the same. The, the richest countries in the world already do this and already win this. In other words, working more does not give you more income. It's the fact that you use more energy that makes you more productive. All right. And again, the richest countries are always the more productive ones. So if you were to link all those metrics at once, you would see that this is um, lines, these are lines traced uh, into times up to the arrow, right? Uh, you would see that as high is the GDP, as low you will be working and you will be using more and more machines to just sustain your way of life. This is clearly obvious on this chart look at all the countries look at all the developed and the richest countries in the world every year that passes they just got more gdp per capita by using more energy and they work less and less that's also what directly uh, means that we have more and more um off days you know i'm not speaking about uh, official uh, ancient um non-working days like they are usually used to history or religion that has just always existed but this is the average daily legal days off in two of the most developed countries in the world again look at this the more machines work the more we don't that's also what created decohabitation not only the fact that we have more and more uh, housings so this allowed emancipation of women who now are not or not as depending from patriarchy as they used to from forced uh, households um, <clears throat> forced um, unions and now they can start living autonomous lives so the inhabitants of the richest countries are going to see 
raise in separations for the cohabitation and a decrease in civil unions and solitary uh, habitat is going to explode all that on more and more surface more and more square meter on the ground surface per person that doubled over the 15, last 15 years uh, not something not anything very funny either um, when a country is rich they it just it just makes children work less on the opposite the poorer is the country the more children work uh, 7 to 14 years old in this graph here this is the reality of the world and if you zoom on this famous subprimes crisis which is actually um, an energetic supply crisis first of all things just a couple of GDP points less and we put the children back to work and because of the machines are incredibly um, incredibly good and profitable into the primary sector agriculture fishing etc um, we just abandon it to feed more and more people with less and less uh, active people in the sec in, in this sector um, so less and less assets human assets are working into agriculture uh, this is actually uh, a diagram in France but you can see the same things in more in the same developed way in all the developed countries and just so you know this is the people um, who are who were um, completely depending on uh, their own um, um, peasant life, their own agriculture life, uh, fishing life and stuff. So um, actually if you asked how many of them were partially depending on their own uh, primary activity, the numbers uh, were actually way higher than this. It was like in France uh, at the big middle of the 20th century, it was actually around 50 percent. Like, you know, these people could just survive without their own activity but they depending on their own gardens their own fields and their own plantations you know and in france for example um i studied my own country a little more and have more easiness to find digits and metrics on my countries but it's just another example could be the same for all other countries it just make tertiary um employment explode today in france because we also have uh, disindustrialized everything uh, we have 75 percent of assets working within the tertiary like we are um, not producing anything anymore uh, in France and so we also had more time to make more studies because we don't have the obligation to go to the fields and um, make you know uh, grow to grow potatoes and uh, whatever you want it to be um, so now we don't have to do this anymore so because the machines are doing this for us so this is uh, the lowest um, qualification level in France this is a couple two years uh, between uh, minus two tw or plus two years uh, when you're around 18 this is usually when you're 18 and this is over 18 and you see that we just exploded this and also we have lost the um, workers um, status now we have more and more employees and uh, superior uh, intellectual professions and jobs and uh, we're losing even trades, um, enterprises, crafters, whatever, we're just losing everything and as you see this is the uh, primary sector too so this is um, people who live from agriculture and this is just as we saw in the last graph decreasing a lot and again, just like as I told you, this uh, formed like uh, a crucible for uh, social struggles, including the, the social struggles for women. So uh, the feminine struggles could just uh, reach up to a point where now women are working almost 50% um, just like men. It should be 51 actually because there are just a little more women than men in the world. but we are close, to, close, very close to the health of assets right now. Okay, so we still have a little patriarchal society, but it's, it's getting better and better. But all the social transformations, when they are marketed or not, um, 
bring their old share of problematics. Uh, among them, uh, the rebound effect. When anything is brought to the great public, to the audience, uh, to, to, to all of us, um, when anything is brought to the general public, it becomes cheaper. The general public, everyone, you, I, anyone, we use it more. So here, again, this is just in France, but you could just have the same in any developed countries, what, o o OECD country, whatever you want it to be. The number of daily kilometers of um, transportation split by mode over two centuries in France. You just see and you just um, realize the way of life that was imported from USA, for example, which was... Um, to to just um, it's a, it's a long story about to to enslave back workers to have them paid uh, more uh, loans um, more more credits uh, to just refund their houses and the means of transportation like mopeds like cars and stuff. Um, so the people starting living further and further away from the job and they started to have more um, of their income um, dedicated to fuels, dedicated to transportation. And same goes for another thing that was invented more or less in the United States is civil um, Aryan transportation, okay? This was just actually coming from uh, mid 20th century uh, from United States Army. Uh, historically speaking, it's a long story to tell, but that's um, basically what it comes from and what now makes people think we can just take planes and go over whatever we can over time. And last but not the least, among other examples, among thousands of examples I could give you, the urbanization uh, level, um, depending on the per capita gross national income. So it's close to GDP, is not the same index, but it's very close to it. The richest the country the more energy it consumes, and notably oil and gas, to create cities. Cities are the avatar of an ultra-rich country. All the goods and provisions are brought by millions of trucks of lorries every single night. And heating, because it's very shared by square meters vertically, is within distributed circuits where you usually find uh, gas for that. Um, for example, if you take a super large ca capital like London or Paris, it just um, it just it it is able uh, to uh, to just support to just subsist up to six percent of its food needs on a daily basis, which is which means if you just cut down oil, the main cities in the world would just collapse within a day or two and will die from starvation and empty themselves, whatever you think. New York, Mexico City, Shanghai, um, Moscow, Paris, London, whatever you want it to be. So, as a whole, if I wanted to summarize all these things through the economic prison uh, instead of the physical prison, that is what I would say. Um, the first step, we go from an individual like you or I, who just had uh, knowledge, skills, you see, to something that monopolizes an individual to just make one skill in particular. So we tailorized society in abroad. And then we just over-specialized activities. So the people are united to do the same thing because it's getting scale. You know, we are just at scale. We are scaling everything to uh, towards larger um, larger structures, larger industries, larger offices. So we have more individuals to do one task now. So we have hyper skill and we are exacerbating models. The capitalistic models now leads us to speak in terms of skill in terms in instead of um, job of profile. And we now talk about human resources instead of speaking about salaries, all right? And then we just liberalize everything. So 
facially we just externalize everything we are more and more incompetent internally so we just depend more and more on whatever is produced on the external um worlds outside your your, your structure so we just um ossify the human activities and we lose the link to to physics so again if we just take some recoil and you just overlook at the situation realize that every activity that we're going to have are actually a pile where everything depends on another one just put just put it in perspective with whatever you have under your ears i'm using a microphone a screen a desk um the walls the house i'm speaking into my mouse my mug everything is a hierarchy of dependencies when it was made extracted from the ground heated cooked uh, when it was uh, assembled when it was melted when it was assembled uh, and transported it's just a huge series of things like a huge pile a heap a, a pyramid okay a, a very inextricable ultra dependent mesh of things but in reality down this pyramid you will always inexorably find machines and their components matter and energy civil energy transform matter and civil energy which is why we just end up with this weak durability paradox we are relying on a more and more complexified and growing activity uh, model i mean we, we're in 2023 when i'm making this talk now um we have people whose income consists in pillaging graphic boards um, crammed with precious material into data centers to execute um, proof of work algorithms to speculate on crypto assets. Yes, Bitcoin, I'm talking about you. In terms of social uh, inutility, um, I think we reached a maximum, a peak. And paradoxically, we have available remaining quantities that are increasing over and over and we have seen they are limited and they are less and less concentrated and we are relying on this whole system for everything in our lives and also this is not based on linear systems this is um, made harder to understand um, as the human brain is not really made and designed to really easily understand what exponentials are. So, if we want to say things another way, uh, we are trending towards a general burnout of our ecosystems, our ecosphere. So, hence, as of our anthroposphere, a, a global, global cascading collapse. And the harder things to realize with exponentials is that when you look closely, you always feel like everything is far, but it's already at our doors and it has already started. But the depletion of resources is not a phenomenon we have um, seen is the complex uh, and immediate danger. It's, a, it's a, a phenomenon of lacking. But paradoxically, on the other side, we have another um, concurrent parallel phenomenon of excess, the planetary boundaries. People always speak to you about growth. You always almost associate this with economic growth. Growth is simple. If you have 10% growth, then if you had 10,000 euros, 10,000 dollars, 10,000 pounds, whatever your currency is, 10,000 yens. If you had 10,000 of this and with 10% growth at the end of a year, growth per year, you would have wasted 500 of them, like burned 500 money of them, and you will still have 500 more. Like someone, some really famous French entrepreneur said one day, in a period of growth, there is no bad manager. But let's see, if we take a graph here, uh, I've put you all the growth rates from 1 to 10. Okay, all the thresholds of growth. On a 100 years exercise, all right, with 10% growth, with 100 years, you just obtain 13,780 times the initial value of what you had. I don't know if you've ever been told this. 
So that's exactly what it does. So now let's consider the initial value to be something like really inertially, like really just, I'm just picking it at random. Okay, so this, let's take the annual energy consumption of the world, all right, which is 585 exajoules, all right, without the H. Uh, it's just millions, hundreds of hundreds, uh, thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands of gigajoules. But if you just waited for 90 years with 10% growth, we should have, we are forced to absorb 100% of the solar energy radiated on Earth, which would mean uh, set up a, a solar um, capturing uh, model machine, something in space uh, with 100% um, uh, yielding uh, that would just put the whole earth uh, within the shadows uh, to just enlighten it, make drones, Amazon drones, connected toilets, whatever you want it to be. And if we just waited for 135 years more, this time we should consume the whole energy radiated by the sun, which means basically putting in a Dyson sphere, capturing all the sun energy to drain into earth whatever and if we just waited one more 145 years this time we just have to pump the whole energy contained within 100,000 stars with which would be the like the equivalent of our suns that's a lot and if you just waited 125 years more which is again just one and a half current human life right it's the whole supposed uh stars in the galaxy that we should use 150 billion stars i mean if i just if i was just to um make this graph longer up to 295 years more we would just consume the whole energy from all the stars that we suppose are existing in the universe all of this within less than 1000 years should i continue or do you understand to better understand uh since the dawn of, of, of time of man we used from micro perceptible to macro perceptible uh, ways uh, resources from both sides renewable resources and non-renewable resources and since a couple centuries we have been um, using those those two stocks uh, and those two uh, streams of things this is a stock and this is a stream so much that we are actually lacking even renewable resources not only non-renewable which of course is just this is just like to be seen as a stock like you have a bank account and you have no more money getting into bank account but you still pay your bills except there's no um, possibility of going on a zero when you're talking about physics our ecological uh, reserve is already depleted like for a long time you have already heard about living on a credit starting a certain day of the years that exactly is what i'm talking about um, going over the overshoot of our current renewable uh, renewability abilities. Uh, you, you see here, biocapacity is just plowing under the weight of ecological footprints. That is, like I say on the previous scheme, we are affecting also the renewable capacities of Earth. The Earth overshoot day is the day we leave we start living on a credit towards our biocapacity estimations. Um, all of you have heard about this, uh, and it's just getting earlier and earlier each and every year that passes. This year was the 28th July. Um, we should expect uh, starting the 20th of July 2022. It's going to be something closer earlier in 2023. We will have consumed the equivalent of what could um, 1.8 Earth planet produce within a perpetual growth. In short, we have um, utilized as many resources over the last 17,000 uh, hundreds of uh, sorry, thousand years uh, that we're going to use in the next 30. This is a growing rate. Now, this is not a decreasing rate. All right. And remember, this is on a finite uh, total which can only decrease up to a point even uh, resources that paradoxically would be destructive for biosphere and would just uh, be missing like car coal uh, coal what we want it to be um, that is very abundant on earth 
is going to is going to lack you know uh, it's not a joke it's the fossil energy that is the most uh, available today and all the forecasts indicate that we have if not already have going to reach a point where we just uh, pass a peak you know a peak coal a peak of exploitation of mining coal in the world um more endangering or not depending which problem you want to face um fossil gas around 150 years and oil just a little more than 42 years to completely exhaust and deplete all the currently con commonly known reserves and supposed reserves the problem is that oil today uh, is the absolute energy of our society is the most used energy in the world is the fossil energy the less easy um, fossil energy that we can substitute um, right now when all stops the world stops it becomes static it becomes silent and without oil we just plunge in a few hours the first and ever problematic that is just facing and coming straight right at us right now and the one we are the least prepared to is the oil peak the peak of oil production worldwide um, i'm just going to explain it shortly um oil up to um like 20 years ago was uh dwelled conventionally which is like um spots that you have on the face when you're young you see you you just pierce them and boom it just uh, blows up to the surface so you just put pipes and barrels and you just gather it and since 2008 7 uh, it's hard to tell but it's between 2006 and 8 we have reached our historical record of this type of oil and since then we have been declining all the time all the time we have never produced more and more but less and less conventional oil since 2007-8 okay to compensate that we just went towards non-conventional oil like uh, sands or um, um, shale oil shale gas um, and we just uh, make um, how to say so in English? <laughs> we, we just make Caesarean uh, operations to Earth where we can extract all that is not really formed yet. It's not completely formed. It's mixed with sand and sometimes with shell hard rock. And we just use hydraulic fraction and fracturation. This is just a, an environmental catastrophe. It compensates the lack of um, conventional oil but now there again it is coming to a maximum and soon the billions of barrels we use every day will not arrive anymore in the meantime we need more and more barrels to just go and fetch more barrels because it's, yes the the machines the industry of oil and natural resources like mining and stuff rely on steel concrete and oil they are all made thanks to um, fossil energy. At the beginning of the 21st century, we used to um, get, as a return, 40 barrels of oil, good quality oil, when we just invested one. Now, 20 years later, we are barely getting 20 and not 40 again for the same type of oil but the non-conventional oil is really less good when you invest one barrel for um sands for shell uh, for um bituminous sands we just get two barrels and when shale oil is at stake we just get 1.8 the only question is when you reach one out of one ratio what do you do you stop the peak of both accumulated ways of extracting oil is expected between somewhere like between 2025 and 2030 but it's actually never been overpassed since 2018 already so when it comes to uranium 2025 205 sorry um the one the isotope that is used into 
fusion uh, reaction centrals and power power plants, you know, uh, for whatever is third generation and less uh, reactors. There is less than a hundred years um, to be used at the current rate. Uh, it just remember it just constitutes one dot eight percent of primary mix, uh, which is what you take in the environment, and four dot five percent of the mix of what you get in the end, which is really um, a good thing because nuclear is very very interesting when it comes to energy conversion. If we all just go full nuclear uh, fission energy for the whole world energy, the whole civil world uh, world civil energy. And we just wait to just just like that to create 22,000 uh, power plants, nuclear power plants. We would just deplete and exhaust the nuclear uh, resources of uranium 225 within five years. All right. And for the rest of elements, because there's not only uranium that is here, if you want to see it. Um, not all the elements are present in, under the surface of Earth, in, in, in Earth's crust, okay? Some of them are just not present at all. Some of them are just present like a couple milligrams per ton. And it's not a ton of Earth, of ground, of malleable ground. It's solid hard rock that you need to extract. But nevertheless, we keep using them and extracting them has become harder and harder. There's a whole methodology, the, this matri matrixes uh, to determine probability and exploitation of um, ores, but I will just spare it for now. But in short, those that you see here are marked at risk, which means um, we are claiming to use more and more of them, but they are starting to be lacking. And there's still no star in sight to send any of us, which is very good. Don't look up. I mean, I cannot do the complete exhaustive list. There is, so, there are so many of them. Um, as you see in this schema, uh, these are remaining years. Outside is if everyone lived like USA, and this is the average world. Uh, sorry, the, the opposite <laughs> average world outside and USA inside. Um, I was not showing the good one. Um, so it, it just means we have 30 years left for silver, 40 for gold. And believe it or not, silver and gold are not used only for jewelry. Um, tens for indium, which is, it is essentially the, the screens of your TVs, your notebooks, your smartphones and stuff. Uh, 40 for lead, which is the leading material used in batteries in the world. Uh, 50 for, um, for, for zinc, you know, for this just, you can just, change sources, you will find variation of methods and presenting results. But um, the the uh, uncertitude beam is reducing and is going shorter and shorter. So you see 40 years for um, 14, uh, 30 for antimony, uh, 16 for coppers. Without copper, uh, there is no digital goods. There are no digital goods. There's nothing digital on Earth without copper right now. Up to a point, all the entities in the world are um, starting to gather strategic material uh, councils and um, organisms. Uh, this is pretty much all you can do. You can negotiate until you deplete. Uh, this is a graph that comes. From, uh, it's um, a two years old graph that comes from um, European Union. In the top right quadrant here, you see those that are already in a critical state. These are light element, light earth, um, rare earth elements and heavy rare earth elements. So you see, there are already a lot of them that are under this problem. And if you look, these are changes in proportions um, per group of, uh, let's say, country development uh, from mineral production. As you can see, all the industrialist countries have decreased their productions and they more than probably exhausted their own reserves slowly and slowly. Then you have the uh, all grades of gold mines uh, per country, per major country that is interesting to look at. And then you have whatever is going to be in Australia, you see, uh, over the last uh, two last two centuries. 
uh, for a couple of selected um, resources like copper, diamonds, gold, lead, zinc, and nickel. And if you just look at it, it's going down. And same goes for copper. If you look at copper, um, which we expect the demand on copper to be multiplied by 1 to 20 uh, between now and 30 years ahead of us, the production is going towards a peak and you can say goodbye to all of this within 30 years. In short, if you were to bring quantity um, to criticity, it just could look up like that. The Mendeleev table could look up like that. The larger, the more present is, like again, that's all you, oxygen, silicate, uh, silicon are most present. And um, I think you, you can really understand easily with this figure how we are in danger with some elements. So what are the use, the stakes of use currently? Uh, we use batteries, we use cells that are not completely, but somehow useful towards um, renewable energy sources like sun and wind. Um, uh, we have motors, we have uh, 3D impressions, we have ICT, which is us, uh, our concern today, um, wind and, and foil leaks, etc. And as you see on the bottom, the, the, the dependence is really closer to addiction than it is to choosing, to choosing you know. So, so what, what should we do? Recycle. Uh, this is what we recycle in Europe, for instance. And as you see, it's not very glorious. Uh, we barely recycle whatever comes from digital in France. A fifth of smartphones are recycled in the end of life. And recycle is not neutral. Recycling is not neutral. Everything has a cost in material and energy. Remember, energy is transforming materials and we need more other atoms to recycle properly. So recycling is about transforming pollution into something useful, reusable, and we just generate another pollution that we should in turn recycle too. Up to a point um, we reach uh, outputs that are acceptable to our, our system. And a good portion of these materials end up uh, decycling, which is they're not really easy if not impossible to recycle anymore at some point. So this is a, um, a chart of uh, recy currently recycled elements. So uh, down less than 25 is often close to zero. And everything, anything that is not colored is just simply not recycled. Sometimes it's collected, but not really recycled. So um, this is a little more complex exercise. So stay with me on this one. This is the breakdown of final energy mix. So like we say, final energy is the one that you have next to your um, um, power output supply. You know, when you just want to plug your computer to the wall, you have a plug. This is the final energy mix, all right? Let's just uh, assume that your cables and stuff do not have energy loss, all right? The energy that is reaching you, okay? So... As we see today, this is the final energy mix, slightly different from the primary energy mix though. But you see again, coal, oil and gas, and biomass here, uh, hydropower and nuclear. You see it's more or less the same graph. If you were to sum it quickly, you would say this is barely non-renewable, like we said at the intro, and this is renewable sources. That is the thing. What is this used for? So on this full graph here, you have, for instance, on the top right, the most easily understandable white, oil. Oil is made for transportation, aviation, road, rail, navigation, and it's used for cooking some things, some residential heating is using oil, oil heaters and stuff. Non-energy use means we also have petrochemicals. You see, we don't only use oil uh, to burn things, we also use it as a matter to make plastic and stuff, all right? Then you have uh, mostly gas here. Um, gas is used for industries, just a very, very easy to set up power plant. It's the easiest of all power plants to make. And uh, it's often used to industries, same for iron and steel here, um, with car coal. This is, this is coal and this is oil. This is gas, sorry. And um, you see it's also used a lot, like I just said a few slides ago, for heating, you know, and commercial and public services means also heating usually. So this is what it's used for, okay? And this is the final mix of electricity. 
um, when it's used, okay, when we have generated electricity, whether VS electricity comes for gas or whatever, right? The thing is, if you put this on a graph, on a, on, on a, on a bar graph, okay, these are, just remember, non-renewable and supposedly renewable or constant, whatever you want to call it, right? So this comes from the primal to the final mix, okay, so I just put you the conversion. As you can know, it's not really easy, but remember, it's growing and we're using more and more of these. And we are using this mix, this growing quantity within this mix as a percent to do the four graphs I put you a few slides ago. And if you were to extract them and distribute them towards what they are, okay? So where does electricity go? Where does um, natural gas go? Where does anything go, okay? The problem is, if you keep doing this, you can scatter this craft differently. But when you realize part of it is going towards the industry and that, uh, in, in which in that um, the um, renewable uh, sources today, like windmills, like photovoltaic panels, like um, hydro power dams, whatever you want it to be, are made from anything that is made thanks to non-renewable energy. They are built with them. So when you extract this industry, and I'm a good person, I didn't include transportation because I suppose that electric uh, transportation can be a thing. It is a thing, but it's not a sufficient thing right now. It's just barely 1% of traffic. But let's assume it is possible. If you were to convert this into something that would be a final mix, then actually you barely have this, which means this is just like less than 5% of what is renewable that can be now used to make new renewable energy. In short, when you modulate this, what it shows is that you barely have 5% of modulated source that can be considered renewable and usable towards renewable again. And that does not solve problems of uh, matter, like when you use um, coal as matter for steel. You see, we trap the carbon um, atoms within the iron atoms. You cannot replace the carbon atoms from steel uh, with windmills. You cannot do this. This doesn't make any sense. We cannot do this with other means. You have to find carbon at some point or you will not have steel. In other words, uh, it means that approximately 95% of all human activities are currently going down and will go down at some point. It's not going to happen in one day, but it's going to happen very fast. Which means 95% of your life, your income, anything you get today will just vanish with whatever we're doing today. And it's doomed to happen one day or another and remember as you saw it's not about if it's going to happen it's when and how fast it's going to happen so we should just for example if we just wanted to illustrate this through carbon emissions only we should just um, have minus four percent emissions per year until 2050 only to match the ipcc's carbon neutral target this is just a, an ideal target for emissions it's not a use, okay? It's not a problematic of use. And if you look at what is happening in the world today, we use, we keep going more and more faster and faster. We should be decreasing, but instead of that, we are completely increasing. We increase, we are increasing in anything. You can just look at any of these graphs. We are increasing our activities. And you can just take it or leave it, whatever we're going to do, uh, depending on which part of the world does it, whether it's uh, the OECD, the, the um, uh, BRICS, the, 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 the um, all the previously called developing countries uh, are doing, they are doing the same. Every country is doing the same, just delayed a little. So if you look at the earth system trends that we have that we have today uh, measured we just increase all the values within all the metrics 
okay uh, we just raise the numbers every day every day we just keep raising the numbers if I wanted to sum up the actual worry um, trying to demonstrate the difference between uh, a stock and um, a stream of goods that I could just show through dynamic systems uh, I would do this here you got the needs of energy that like raising okay this is raising because we need we are requiring we are expecting we are asking for more and more energy final energy so as we need more and more final energy we need more and more um, primary energy all right but to do that we need more and more resources material resources because we need more machines so we need more fossils more minerals whatever so we need to extract more but as we need to extract with more machines we need more machines to extract more materials to make more machines and to also mm, produce more through the use of more energy so this is a positive action on all these things okay this is the problem the main problem we have today we need more energy which means we need more energy to get more energy it needs it means more material we also need more material so we also need more material for more materials and this requires more energy and all of this is positive retraction once you have understood the basic concepts uh, as you know you can refine your model so if you just make uh, something that also adds the energy density and the mineral density all right which is going down as we just saw uh, you got this more complex system here and if you want a, a, a very complex and a system that I just set up within a few minutes that should heavily be criticized it's just a, a bare system I just had the idea of within 15 variables you just get this and this is what we call complex system dynamics we observe very complex phenomena like spontaneous appearing of exponentials oscillations retroaction feeds etc but let's suppose that we just take significant variables here a lot of them okay 150 of them or something like that that are very important and relevant to modelize the world we use today that are measurable and we simulate an extension of current reality that is exactly what a group a team of mit searchers from uh, 50 years ago exactly 50 years ago have done um, leaded by Donella and Dennis Meadows, who were systematicians. Um, you can start this. This is a screenshot I made from a simulation. You can start it on the web. You don't really see the curves on the right of population, pollution, and natural resources available. So let's just look closer. The report they published, um, based on a model named World 3, is called the limits to growth. And it was sold up to 30 million uh, copies is worldly known famous but nevertheless since the last 50 years we have spread out the observations the real metrics the real data on what we have done since they published it 50 years ago up to today and it's without an appeal everything means if we just follow the models civilization as we conceive it today should be collapsing within 12 to 40 years between 2030 and 2060 which is currently the most probable scenario mostly axed under the um, oil the peak oil that we just discussed a few slides ago a sudden and uncontrollable industrial production and population collapse that is exactly the world the words that they used into the report all right so if you just look closer um actually you we, the the model pre just explains and just um tells us that the birth rate should be on the decline the death rate should be on the rise and at some point population should therefore go down ways whatever the scenario you take they studied a few scenarios changing the metrics we you can just go online and change the metrics if you want to be optimistic or pessimistic on some metrics and then um 
we have run uh, the um, world 3 model against reality so if you just look at what's been observed as data we just don't perform really well so um, actually we are most of the time um, getting close to the worst scenario and for some metrics we are going close to the best so as a result um, pollution is going to increase up to a point it just goes away because we won't be able to produce anything else and the non-renewable resources are going to go down as you already know because they are not renewable and the world GDP growth as you see it on this graph has already started going downwards so now you understand two things first the anthem consisting in says what world we will lead and let to our children is not even enough starting yesterday you were already fighting for yourselves as much as you are for future generations and the notion the concept of sacrifice has no impact no use and second thing anyone now speaking to you about economic growth is a fucking liar they got no notions no ways of physics and systemics or reality and the hardest thing you're going to face now is not the others is not what you think it's going to be yourself because when the world collapses this is just like being slapped in the face by an invisible hand all the time the world around you collapses one by one people will see their lives fall unemployment poorness no more food scarcity shortages you're going to face it and you're going to wonder because we are very creative we have very creative minds when we don't have a guilty person because we we want a guilty person and we will never think or accept that the guilty one is actually us when you look at ourselves in the mirror so what is going to be easy is to name someone else and to pretend that the problem is coming from someone else you have to reach a godwin point at some point so let's do it now um, we already know if we open history books what mankind is about to do and what humanity can do to people if you look at Pol Pot, Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin whatever you wanted to take you know exactly what way we can do the problem is if you start wars and there are wars currently being raging over the planet you are going not to get more resources so you can save your people you're going to exhaust and waste all your current resources faster which is why at some point if you want to go over war you'll have to use oil because otherwise you won't be doing anything you won't be going anywhere so when oil is starting to lack you won't be doing any war you will just be staying at home and wondering why and how it happened so right now you have to be very careful about what you do if you keep going to the liberal way where everything is supposed to be capitalistic and therefore as Karl Marx said supposed to be based on infinite economics you know exactly where it leads and if you were trying to be restrictive and protecting yourself which is it's pretty normal for you human if you get hurt your first reflex is to put your hands on the place it hurts and to uh, crumble on yourself this is exactly what you do at a country scale when you get hit you you get into a defensive mode you think like you're getting aggressed by someone outside and what is aggressing you right now what is threatening you is no more than yourselves it won't be the other ones it won't be the ones over the boundary that you crossed over the frontier that you set over the walls that you have set on your frontiers these guys are not going to be uh, consuming you your countries your resources they'll just be human just like you and that won't do anything so 
you have to be strong and now what you need is a complete change of mind and find out new ways to construct the world um, for yourself and the future generations. To better understand this um, omnipresent um, and historic term of growth, I would just like to debunk a myth first that you have heard of, the one that is called sustainability, durability. Um, durability or sustainability is a word that should be resonating in you. Um, you obviously have heard of uh, durable development, uh, which is already by nature a paradox. But weak durability is an economical concept that, just please remind ourselves, is a human invention. Economics are human. It's a human invention. It wouldn't exist without human on Earth. Uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, a famous French economist, also speaks about history applied to observations of streams and and doesn't speak of economy like um, a science to guess the future. So in 1994, the World Bank uh, summed up capital into three fields. Uh, environmental fields like biosphere, uh, economies, economical capital and social capital. Weak sustainability is um, is coming from um, the theories, the economic theories that are called classic theories, that are the fundamentals of any institution in the world today, uh, from the largest schools to your political leaders to whatever you, your, your marketing and commerce schools, uh, the crushing majority of people who have power in the world um, have been following this since their childhood. It just considers that you can interchange, you can exchange those capitals as long as the sum remains unchanged. Um, being said, uh, human capital um, can be substituted to biological capital. Like, if there is not enough wood for everyone, you just need more humans. This is pretty dumb. Strong sustainability, on the other side, is the concept of systemics. Um, Herman Daly, in 1990, formulated three conditions. The first one is the, 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 the consumption pace of um, renewable resources shouldn't exceed the renewable, uh, the, the renewable pace of regeneration of uh, these resources. So you shouldn't uh, burn resources faster than they just renew. Second, you can consume non-renewable resources uh, as long as you don't uh, do it faster than the rhythm, the pace at which you can find substitutes uh, in, in, within something that is renewable. So as long as you want to burn oil, uh, coal, whatever, it's fine. If you put pollution apart, it is fine, but you have to use it to construct a world where you would be using renewable resources and third, the pollution emission uh, emitting resources, uh, the pollution emitting um, shouldn't overpace the capacity of our environment to absorb and assimilate its pollution. In other words, it is impossible to, for, to, to go over the uh, biological capital and we are inscribed, we are within this capital with our capital, with ours. The human organizations, and if you want to do so, the economic organization being a macro uh tool within that, all right? This is a huge difference between the two concepts. So we have seen the danger of the systemic danger of um, constantly growing. We have seen the physical boundaries uh, that constrained us. Now we have to talk about the consequences, direct and measurable consequences of our activities. Uh, because up to now we were only regarding our needs, but on the opposite of this wall there's another wall that's coming to us. The wall of planetary boundaries, consecutive to our activities. The scientific consensus has defined nine uh, planetary boundaries that we have to contain. Um, the model proposed by uh, Johan Rockström uh, sum, sums them up with this model. So you see, 
uh, this is the systemic study of our environment. So you set up metrics, um, you set up a threshold, which is this dotted line here with the earth, but you shouldn't uh, overcome, you shouldn't uh, go over, you shouldn't uh, pass this uh, boundary. And then you measure what's being done in reality, which is the colored thing again, since as you see, we are far away from being okay and we have a lot of work to do. So I'll just um, review them in a few seconds. Uh, we would need hours for each of them. So first of all, fresh water use. So this is uh, water on Earth, uh, all the water on Earth, and this is all the air on Earth. Uh, edible water should only be the reflection here and breathable air should only be the reflection here. So just to see the order of magnitude that you are speaking about. So uh, on a very thin pellicle on the surface of earth water. Water is 97.5% in oceans, 2.5% in the rest in fresh water. This fresh water is used, is present is, uh, for 90, let's say 80% into uh, ice caps and glaciers um, and 20% in groundwater and 1% for the rest and the rest is 52% in lakes, 38% uh, in soil and then you got the water that is inside the atmosphere because there is water in the atmosphere and then in living organisms and then rivers uh, which is 1% of 1% uh, of uh, 2.5% and this red water we're using here uh, is actually used 70% of it for irrigation, 20% 20 for, 20 for industry, and 10% for our domestic use, like um, washing, etc. Does this ring a bell to you? Maybe or not. This is a French talk I've been doing, but this is one of the major rivers in France. One of the four major rivers in France is the Rhin. Uh, the, the, this river uh, was, this photo was taken in 2018. And this is the main French river we have. Mm, same year, 2018, completely dry out. Um, this is a video um, of people who just um, took it the same year as I'm talking. This was actually last year now. This is because I'm um, so 1st January 2023. This was taken in 2022, summer 2022. They are usually a couple of meters high of water here. All right. Um, this is the river R in Germany in 2021. 200 deaths within one night between Belgium and Germany. If you have the cynicism to believe that everything is far from you, you will have to give up this idea now because uh, perturbating water is also a, a worry. This is the the Valley de la Vesubie in 2020. It's the southeast of metropolitan France. It's what we call a Mediterranean episode when, um, if you don't know the geography of it, uh, there is this sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that is very close to the Alps mountains. So within a couple tens of kilometers, you go from zero, from ground zero, so from zero level to, to ocean level to, to a couple kilometers high. And this produces very short and fast water cycles and sometimes you can have up to um up to one year of rain within two or three days so this is an example of what it can do And um, as you can guess, the two people who were in this house um, died a few seconds after this video was taken. I will just not include this video uh, from distancy towards them, but they did. 
Um, when it comes to water quality, here are the locations where water is threatened by pollution. This index crosses uh, this boundary and the next one, which is actually the novel entities, the polluting new entities introduced into the environment. If I would just ask you to draw what pollution looked like, you would just very often draw um, a factory rejecting very dirty things into a river. That is more or less what it is about. So this is about introducing polluting entities that are not supposed to um, exist where you find them, you see, uh, chemical elements, molecules, radiation, etc. They are by the thousands. We can make a focus on very famous um, elements like alcines or antibioticals, uh, uh, pesticides, etc. So also you can just took an example with plastics, uh, which is mostly non-biodegradable items at a decent scale, okay? These are plastic gyres that you have all the uh, all over all across the oceans and earth. Um, very tiny particles, a few thousand per square kilometers that just um, gather where the, the, the streams stop and go below the surface. So yeah, third limit, uh, third boundary would be biosphere integrity, which is what we saw as an introduction. The living and it's very fragile and terrible eco uh, global ecosystem. Uh, the World Wildlife Foundation, you know, the panda, uh, the little panda um, logo here, has followed the evolution of th 3,000 to 7,000 species, um, key species, over the last 50 years. And the results are without a doubt what you have heard of 70% of the living has already disappeared on Earth. Uh, this is not definitive, you can still act. I could let you see in details what it does depending on where you live but you also see that um, after constraining the vital space of certain species they just end up disappearing for good which is a point of no return that you cannot really consider safe for anything this fourth limit the climate change is the one we've been talking about right now this climate change is uh, pretty simple to understand as um, a consequence that is not really um, enjoyable of our use of our main energy sources like um, deforestation, uh, biomass, uh, oil, coal, uh, natural gas, etc. We are rejecting molecules in the atmosphere that have a particularity. They are transparent against um, sun rays and our star and they are opaque to against uh, infrared radiation that is sent back from earth to cool from the energy received from this um, luminous rays from its sun rays and a little more we also emit a little more molecules that have the opposite properties but not enough to compensate it and these molecules this gas um, contributes towards global warming um, by altering our radiative forcing which is actually changing the um, energy, in, energy um, accountability of earth if you if you want to think about this uh, without them uh, we would just without these molecules we would just be uh, straight straight in right now at the surface of earth or at earth uh, um, we would be at something like minus 18 celsius degrees at the surface of earth uh, and with these gases uh, notably co2 uh, we are supposed to be at plus 15 okay with some oscillations that you can find in time this is an example of the two tw the um, the holocene which is uh, 10,000 previous years all right so the second problem is these anthropic emissions would just lead us to plus one or one degrees over a very short period here that you see on this right of this graph over barely 200 years while our climate our current climate very very stable as we can see on this graph was relatively going down actually and we are not going towards the downtrends okay so the United Nations have mandated an organism to gather all the scientific literature on the subject, the IPCC. And the IPCC published a report every six years um, on the average. They have just published the six reports and the six assessment reports on that. 
and the scenario have projections that are without uh, a doubt going uh, the really, really bad way. Without a pill, we are going the bad way. If we just continue doing what we do, we're going to change uh, the climate for centuries, like we are already doing right now up to four dot plus 4.9 celsius degrees on the average double on the continents because oceans don't absorb heat that much and it should be something like eight times more on the peak you can imagine what it does as a consequence so um, whatever the scenarios you have studied it goes nowhere good and it generates instabilities that are impossible to modelize or forecast in short, our current um, way of life does not allow us to have a viable uh, scenario for the moment. This is why, um, as we just renounce to nothing and we have no substitute, as we have seen, remember, uh, the energetic and material transitions do not exist. We just use more and more or of more and more things. Okay. And despite the different uh, conference of parties, the COPs, nothing has been changing. And nothing's been changing means uh, impossible to exactly forecast and guess consequences, non previsible consequences. So we have bands here, as you see on the equator and the poles, um, that would be hostile to any human living up to 40 degrees Celsius difference over the averages uh, changes in um, water scattering in si water cycles in uh, desert zones in hundreds thousands of different impacts so many impacts that we we barely can make an exhaustive list of this of the of these impacts and we just add more and more every day hydrosphere pedosphere uh, lithosphere, cryosphere, um, biosphere, um, diversity of the living, scattering of the living, um, mortality on continents and oceans, the consequences are by the thousands. And now again, remember those consequences offer systemic loops, uh, retroactive loops, which means the consequence of what we do are aggravating the sources. Okay, it's self-sustaining. I wanted to spare and share the visual results because it wouldn't be decent, but I think what is not decent is to actually not show them. Um, so that then we are a little closer to avoid greenwashing. So so that, that yeah, that if you just look at that, it's hard not to look right. That is Madagascar in 2020, 400,000 uh, people in a state of famine, um, over a million under um, feed insecurity, uh, eating cacti and crickets. For the first time, uh, a famine has been um, officially stated as being mainly in the name of climate change alone. This is British Columbia in Canada with an absolute total record of 49.6 Celsius degrees um, on, on the 29th of June 2021 in Lytton. Uh, this is Karnoyarsk in northern Russia in 2019, 2,000 kilometers of fire. Uh, the North Pole has been facing 40 degrees above normal average. This is Australia in 2020. This is not a recolored picture. These are the original colors. Um, during this event, 3 billion vertebrates um, died. Um, some of them were placed under... Uh, the state of being an endangered species uh, only on one event. This is Lion's Head Mountain in Cape Town um, in South Africa in 2019. Uh, this is Braga in Portugal in 2017. 66 dead people, 220 people uh, were injured. This is in Turkey on the flanks of Anatolia in 2021. If you just look here, this is a six or seven uh, floor building, so you can imagine the columns of flames, how high they are. This is Delhi in India in 2022. Uh, the city of Nabwasha has registered uh, 49.5 degrees Celsius. So uh, I just, I, I missed, 
including this video properly but i think you can understand this is a train in spain last year that was in the middle of flames during um a global warming moment you see so um our emissions of uh, greenhouse gas um, create all that which is mostly carbon dioxide from fossil fuels um, methane that comes from uh, agricultures bovine rice culture etc and um, nitrous uh, peroxide from uh, fertilizers um, it comes from all our activities just like every other boundary if you are wondering what you can do to stop that you have to reduce all of this you can look at this as long as you want this is all your life so you have to reduce everything you're doing in your life fifth planetary boundary the depletion of the stratospheric ozone um, the ozonosphere is a part of the atmosphere that is rich in ozone it um, contains approximately 10 particles per million which is quite a lot this is o3 and it's formed mainly from the oxygen okay so um, since the years uh, 1970 we have discovered that some of the molecules we were using um, very very commonly were reacting with atmospheric ozones and depleting it uh, notably on the south pole and this layer was uh, being attacked faster than it would regenerate so just to tell you the computing models uh, predict that a diminishing of 10 percent of atmospheric um, ozone concentration could provoke each year 300,000 uh, skin cancer 400 and 4,500 melanomes and between 1.62 and 1.7 million ca uh, cases of um, I want to uh, of, of cataract you know of the, the cataract the eye disease is more 10% would be only that more in the world so currently we estimate that thanks to reactions that were really easy to take on this boundary it was only a chemical problem so we substituted molecules for other molecules we should have stabilized this limit for now and the ozonosphere is currently for the first year expected to slowly heal over the next decade to come six planetary boundary um the atmospheric aerosol loading uh, when anything happens on earth not everything remains in the water or soils and part of it uh, goes under suspension in the air sand water dust uh, volcanic ashes but also um, um, small particles light enough so that they can remain in the air for some time and very often coming from the industry we count them by the hundred they have cycles movements very complex movements and consequences on the health of the living that could be very very grave and very dangerous we estimate that these particles alone uh, would diminish um, the human life expectancy globally by two years just from these particles in the current use one of the most track ones the um, black carbon which is the paracrystalline uh, form the most elementary form of carbon is often named as soot. Uh, soot is um, a way to provoke respiratory problems among the others. The seventh planetary boundary is ocean acidification uh, that is very uh, tied to um, climate change because it, it, in fact actually 24 percent of CO2 uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, is precipitated into water and water is the largest um, carbon reserve you know and it has very grave consequences by solubility or dilution this has as an effect of diminishing the um, hydrogen potential of uh, water and the marine ecosystems are already threatened and not only coral you can see this is the same photo 15 years difference of coral um, from 90, from 1751 to 2004, uh, 2004, the the um, hydrogen potential of superficial water has already downed from uh, 825 to 840, which is not a linear scale. Which means the 
acidification has went uh, by 20% more. And this is a real, real dangerous threat for all marine life. Eight, eight limit the um, biochemical flows, um, just to make it simple. A biological flow is a flow of the living, like you live, you grow up, you die, okay? Uh, a geological flow is a flow that has linked to Earth. And a chemical flow is a group of chemical interactions. So a biogeochemical flow is a flow that accumulates all of this. In short, uh, we use fertilizers that are very concentrated that end up in rivers and um, and uh, if you look at them in the river end uh, so if, if you look at river deltas uh, they usually contain whatever is the, the sum of all what's been precipitated into the water of the rivers uh, um, above um, these deltas all right so we just also um, pee and poop into edible water that goes back into um, groundwater because it is not uh, filterable. We just filter um, living stuff, uh, very larger molecules, but not some, not anything that is just that precise. So uh, notably, we do not filter uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrous. So uh, we just explode the planetary boundary on this one. This is what we call, this, this creates a eutrophization of water, uh, which means um, the living is exploding and, you know, it's smothering, it's completely smothering into the rivers. Um, if you have heard about Sargas's um, green algae, uh, um, ooze, flooded rivers and stuff this is exactly what's happening so along with the biodiversity loss that it also affects uh, and the new polluting entities these are at the current moment the three planetary boundaries we have most um, uh, dangerously uh, crossed right um, and the last limit to end of this part the perturbation in the land system change uh, L-U-L-U-C-F, you know, land use, land use and change and forest change. Uh, the surface of Earth is 71% water, 29% Earth, uh, ground, you know, continental crust. And uh, the the habitable land um, is only 71% of its whole land surface. The rest is not, as you can see, uh, habitable. Uh, these lands are half for agriculture and the rest is forest, uh, savanna, shrub base, and, you know, very uh, intermediary lands that are not really bare, that are not really forest either. And most of it goes into um, growing stuff. And we only grow stuff mostly, as you see, for livestock. Uh, you see three quarters of this goes towards livestock more than three quarters actually it's just crazy so um as a few numbers 200 hectares are uh, completely raised uh, of forest every uh day in the profit of cities we we are um we are completely uh raising we are clearing we are reclaiming uh, 200 hectares, hectares of um, wild souls every day to make more cities. 20% of the earth that is above the water has not yet been greatly impacted by human activity. And we are deforesting 0 0.6 to 1% of it all every year. If you take these values and you put them on a, on a map, on a world map, it just does that. Uh, so this is to better help realizing how much it is um, if you think about the permafrost uh, thawing it's 50 times faster than expected it just frees um, methane CH4 uh, into the atmosphere and this methane is 20 times to 28 more times more intense than CO2 in greenhouse effect and each year 80,000 square kilometers of forest are disappearing um, Right now on Earth, there are less than 50% trees uh, remaining that Earth used to have like 20, um, tw uh, like 12,000 years ago. 
And systemic interactions, as we saw earlier, within these planetary boundaries are incredibly numerous and complex. Just for just for exchanges between soils, fresh water, forests, uh, and and um, and oceans, uh, the system can be very very complex to modelize. And one last word, because I hear that very often. Um, one last word about uh, demography. Some people, a lot of people, are saying that the problem is that we are too many on Earth. This is usually because people don't know anything about planetary boundaries and the only exponential curve they have seen is the worldwide population, which we can see um, on this graph here. So usually that's the only exponential people have been confronted to, so they believe that is the only reason why we have a problem. The thing, as you know, and as we have seen, is that growth is the problem. If you keep doing harmful things to the planet and you keep also growing, which means developing these harmful things, whether you are 2, 5, 3, 7, or 50, or 100 billion people on Earth doesn't change anything. We could probably be 100 billion on Earth right now if we lived like like um if we lived like maybe 1000 years ago with the same uh, consumption of material it would probably not be durable but we could do that probably so the number is not a problem by itself you see um first of all um <clears throat> you have to understand right now it's a problem of um of uh scattering and of um who owns what share of production it's, it's a problem of distribution if you look at who is emitting pollution who is crossing planetary boundaries right now it is mostly as we saw depending on the gdp so the richer the country the more they do consume the planet if you were right now to cut like just for just for carbon accountability for instance if you just speak about climate change if you just cut down two-thirds of the planet you just kill you don't have me why and how i don't want to know you just exterminate two-thirds of the planet right now uh, the poorest people you would just remove 15 to 20 percent of the problem so that is not the problem if you just now use like what we call the thanos effect like the snap you just take one person out of two uh, at random in the world and you just kill them i don't know how you do that but you just got the infinity stones whatever and um you manage to do that if you do that the problem is you just divided the population by two so the effect the systemic effect the growth of countries and stuff are still the same so there is no population problem this is very hard to understand it's a point of view that is derived from seeing pollution and uh, precious stuff like earth as a bank account it is about like um we are ending the month with uh, less than zero money on the bank accounts so uh we we have a problem right now uh we we are um how to say so we are um we are uncovered like right now we are overdrawn uh each and every month so we have to look at what we're doing and we have to cut the expenses Okay, that, that's that's the vision that these people have, and they believe that world population is an expense. Like we we are spending too much human people, and we should kill them. So first of all, thing I'd like to know how these people want to consider human lives as they consider uh, atoms, as they consider energy or any type of resources. That is not the same. You're speaking about a human life. So if you care about the world, if you care about the living, about the animals, about the plants, about everything that we have exterminated on Earth, you should care about yourselves exactly the same as an antispecist uh, point of view. You should be caring about everyone at the same time. And your problem is not the number of people, as we saw. It's what you do with your life. So the problem, again, is another way of... Uh, pushing down the fault and responsibilities onto someone else. Notably, when people say so, if they are living in a rich country, you say, all right, you think there are too many people on the planet, so go down, start it, show us how do you reduce the population, starting with you. 
And the problem then is that they wouldn't want to go away by themselves, So, which is actually normal. So the problem is not the population. You're not talking about an asset that you can spend. And the good news is that even if the world was, which as we saw is not going to be the case, but even if the world was growing, we have a peaceful and perpetual growth rate. It will not go infinitely towards billions and billions more. That is a complete ignorance of how population works. Population in the world suffers and follows a very common rule that is called demographic transition. And demographic transition means that if you look at uh, the fertility rate per woman uh, under the age of um, procreation, the thing is, you go in all the places in the world. This time, you don't care about boundaries. You, we, we just observe this within each country, right? Because we have boundaries. But it does not it is not a problem of boundary. You can study this for a city, for a place or a region, for a boundary, for a continent. It will be always the same. Every place in the world has had a switch between a very, very high six, seven, eight um, fertility rate, uh, which is um, six, seven, eight children per woman in the age of procreation to suddenly less than three and actually closer to two. And if not under two, which means usually uh, you would just fall under um, you would just fall under the rate, the minimal rate of population increase. And what you see right now is that all the countries in the world have mostly done this demographic transition, which is a space a moment in time when populations consider the things differently. They start rep they stop reproducing for survival they start reproducing for purpose for by willing uh, to do so um, they start reproducing and having children because they want to not because they feel like they have to and that's a huge difference they don't have 10 children out of which two-thirds will die hoping that one will grow high and old enough to care about themselves and to um, to to look after them when they get older. So that is a huge change in the world. And as you can see, most of the countries have already done these transitions. Um, it takes more or less. The, the first countries who did that, like France, United Kingdom, like the older developed countries, notably in Europe most of the time, have done it very, very slowly because it took a lot of time because they started this transition very, very earlier than the other ones. In other terms, global Earth population is supposed to have this demographic transition. If you look right now how it's happening, actually you will see that over the world the population from 1950 to today to the future, if you just imagine the future, is going to follow this way. In other words, you're going to have less and less uh, young people compared to older people, which is why right now, if you were to stop having children right now, all over the world, you would not reach, let's say, half the population under 40 years or something like that. And we, we won't be stopping right now. Okay, so people are already pregnant and stuff, so you wouldn't stop it. And the problem is if you do that, if you were to do that, you would not spend less on resources. You would not consume a lot of resources. So even if we did that, we would start showing a population decrease like you have on this graph. For a couple of years, a couple of decades, we do not have decades. We cannot kill the people, we cannot wait for the people to die. Demographic is not a tool. You cannot rely on this. Demographic is a demographic is a, is, is a consequence of that. It's a consequence of that. So you, I could speak about this for hours, but you have to listen to lots of people. Um, I listen to Emmanuel Pont in France, for example, but lots of people are speaking about that. So if you just look at what's going to happen, what is supposedly happening, um, either you go to a population collapse, and this is more likely the 
scenario, even if you just had growth and a world of continuous uh, prosperity, you would have less and less people. Actually, right now, the richest countries are showing declines of population. Japan, Italy, Germany could be included into that too. Uh, United States, England. If you don't have a migratory uh, balance that is uh, bringing more people from the outside, most of the richest countries right now are decreasing in terms of population. And therefore, the expected number of people on Earth should be between two, between 10 and 15 billion people on Earth at most. And then it will start decreasing because people will not and won't be willing to have more children. Okay, so this, as you see, this is how demography works. This is how we have seen it on the whole world exercise on all the countries. So actually, most of the countries right now have finished and completed their demographic transitions. Uh, part of the um, Middle Orient, part of Africa hasn't completed over yet. And that's mostly what is going to change over the next years. India has almost completed it and China has completed it. And it's actually stabilizing right now. So population when you talk about it is not an asset is not a resource like you cannot consume less humans to have more coal per person or whatever it's not working like that right so try not to use the demographic um, argument within that also even if we were just one million inhabitants on the planet if we had the same use of non-renewable energy and the same biocapacity exceed as of today that would be the same problem. And as we've seen, a growth rate of just 10% in use with the same population gives catastrophic results very fast. Even if it's 1%, it means one day or another, maybe centuries coming, maybe to the coming millenniums, at some point somewhere is going to have the same problem that we're facing today. So again, this is not the problem, right? And let's go again. So um, when you speak about that um, in a whole, at a glance, the question I'm being asked very often is, will we get out of this situation? Um, I often answer that. The person that can answer yes, no, maybe why is a very clever one. Uh, which I'm not. So it's hard to tell uh, how it's going to be under such instabilities. First of all, what do you call save yourself? That's where I start. So my personal response to that is clear. No, we have all the data we, n we need to know that under the current living conditions, the actual system, the current system, will not allow us to be living with a sustainable world just like that. Not within accomplishing absolutely colossal efforts. Um, these efforts are not really measured by most of the people. But I think you started now to see and understand slowly how large these efforts um, are. Uh, deleting all these destructive effects is deleting whatever composes our lives, our activities, what you own, what you have, what you do. Nothing is spared from your cloths to your pens, from your walls to your furniture, from your jewels to your toothbrushes, from you, your hygienic menstrual protections to uh, surgery interventions, from food to for your babies to your piano from your iron uh, stuff uh, for for cloths to your toilets from your edible water to your medicine from your dental crowns and uh and um anything that related to dental to your connected speakers from your dustbin bags to your trips abroad nothing will be spared you will have to reduce everything so 
yes everything is possible but the windows are getting really really narrower the walls the walls are approaching us especially the wall that is in front of us don't believe that nothing's done it's not you shouldn't be facing uh the people with power you know uh shouting at them you know uh it's not about yourselves either you don't shouldn't take a mirror and say i'm the only one responsible for that you are just going to create a, a cycle of inaction of an action you know it's really our whole civilization as a whole and the richest and most developed countries um, before everyone else that we need to change so we're working on something and the best thing to do is first of all to look at this kind of conference thank you for being here but just to sum up uh, this is your um, this is a sword uh, you have above your head this is your countdown the only thing that matters today when you speak and you think politics society uh, structures economy um, sociology psychology this is going to govern and decide the rest it will whip out sweep away the rest and independently of your little and large convictions the cliche of the old grumpy guys uh under the syndicates the the startup um bullcrap young people with their little um daddy inheritance mentality whatever everything is going to melt at the same time if we don't act and once you took your electric shock do not stay unarmed you are ready to work you have to get informed you have to recoup your information you have to cross your sources uh, be careful about disinformation spheres um, stay away from the, the fascist temptation um, from rejecting others from abandoning uh, because actually good news we find good news every day but for the moment no solution is a perfect substitute allowing an infinite growth probably never be just because physics has its laws and the laws of physics are not deciding inside any parliament there is no ultimate solutions no technology to change everything but there's there are millions of little things to to make work all together that can create a meteor solution and something but we have to completely change our way of thinking our mind systems we we are very very far away from what we speak about every day in the news in the media we are very far away from that so yeah you're still holding up so now we have seen all of this let's talk about digital because it's an infinite small fraction of the problem but it's our problem too because everyone is uh, having a responsibility shared responsibility as a user but also as a digital worker for example so what if we tried to save the world and or make me help the world not crash too fast make like put mattresses under our asses when we reach the hit the ground you know mm. i think it's worth it right so it's all part now let's see what we can do for digital digital for start is not something that you're going to enjoy too because it's complicated it's complicated because nobody is speaking about the same thing nobody is measuring the same thing it's um intertwined into our activities and it's very often opaque in short when we speak digital we speak usage and usage we do everything with digital we get information information we just communicate we we are getting entertained we use services we buy we learn we manage our finances we create social links etc there's no one sector of digital if you see on the left here uh that is not completely to partially digitalize this is these are the most uh prevalent sectors in economy and uh when they are blue they are extremely digitalized and when they are red they are not really digitalized so you see it's pretty much everywhere so a phenomenon we call digital transformation consists in um, rationalizing and modelizing everything in a digital form and then transferring uh, non-digital activities to digital activities we can divide them in three great three large main zones um, the industry that utilizes uh, digital 
the usage uh, that we do as a consumer and the digital society economy and um, social actors. Uh, the problem is that digital is dispersed, is diluted into a lot of activities, um, among which the largest companies in the world and um, the whole stream, the whole ensemble of streams is still a jungle, an El Dorado that is completely under control, uh, not really under control, sorry, but that became vital to us. So digital, for a start, we've gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, um, depending on on studies, all the studies uh, being very opaque and not very sourced or verifiable. Um, we are between 2 to 5% of the total of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we, uh, and it's really rising, clearly uh, rising. 3% is the equivalent of the whole road fleet of trucks uh, carrying um, stuff for us every day. So the whole pollution, the whole digital the whole digital world pollutes about the same as the trucks, um, the millions of trucks circulating every day in the world. Uh, that would be 0.2% of fresh water and it would just represent also between two and four percent of primary nitrogen use, depending on studies, again between four and seven petawatt hours. Um, the two main things you have to understand when it comes to digital is that first, uh, the essential of it comes from the material, the hardware, that is grouped by usages of um, civil energy, uh, fresh water, water balance, uh, where we call it to be, and a biotic uh, use, a biotic resources use, uh, mostly mineral use. Um, and two, the thing that you need to understand the most is that it's going to grow. We speak about 10% of market growth for anything that's linked to digital every year. Um, most of the time we are proceeding uh, through distinguishing digital as itself from uh, onboarded digital into other electronic systems. So most of the time we will take as a reference any machine that has a processor that can execute any program, anything that is uh, programmable, right? Um, so when it's programmable, usually it's a uh, complete Turing machine is something that we call uh, something that is linked to digital. So if you look at the energy of the whole, we are already in a very high growth rate. Whatever the scenario you are using, we are approximately 8.5% uh, higher every year, which means for resources consumed by these machines, uh, we will be dividing in three, uh, the backend part, the data, data centers, whatever, uh, the network part and the user terminal part. And you see the systemics today means do not change your terminal, do not change your computer, do not change your smartphone, your TV, do not change anything. And if you just look at the energy consumption of digital, it mostly comes from two things, production and use. So uh, you will find many sources, more or less 20 points on each side, which is very complex to analyze. If you just want to break down, break this down into usage and manufacturing, it's very complex. But most of the time, you see that the problem will come from uh, manufacturing. So, quite a lot of it comes from what is server side, where we have as networks, storage, um, software servers, machines, equipment, infrastructure. We usually um, call that data centers, which really covers much more than data, but it really covers exactly what you mean with center, if you have never seen what they look like. Uh, and as you can see, we can find some of these all across the planet. Uh, only the, the data centers only represent a lot of work in terms of consumption, but data centers is are far from being everything because it's very practical for us. We believe they are not under our responsibility, but they are, which is absolutely wrong. If you stop using the services, you won't need the data centers. So 
when it comes to the second part, the network now, uh, the, the bandwidth, the world bandwidth, as, as you can see, is exploding and it does not exist for free. It's tomorrow, uh, it's um, currently um, the smallest um, part of these uh, three um, parts I showed you in the breakdown, the global breakdown, but it's the one growing the most, essentially because of video, from porn videos to Netflix, from YouTube to whatever you want it to be. And then for what we need to analyze um, when we speak about pollution of tunnels, um, computers, um, mobile phones, um, connected fridges, whatever you want it to be, it's very clear again, production on the left is responsible for all possibly possible pollution okay and um, when you look at waste uh, this is illustrating pretty far and pretty well the danger of explosive growth as I was talking to you electronic waste e-waste should have totalized once again the accountability the accountability is very very unreliable uh, worldwide, it should be, it should have accounted for 57 millions of tons in 2021. We are expecting it to reach 74.7 million tons in 2030 and 110 million tons in 2050, with the current growth rate. And also the um, calculation index of used resources per manipulated resources, like the ecological rucksack are without any form of appeal. We, we just need around um, 85 kilograms of um, matter taken from the ground for an average smartphone. We use one ton, one complete ton of matter from the extracted from the ground to just make one notebook and almost eight tons for an average TV. Producing cars consumes way less material than producing smartphones. We need 80 times more energy per gram of smartphone than we need per gram of car. And waste management is an absolute catastrophe. Um, almost everything goes to wild wastes abroad, um, usually into the poorest countries. Because in a smartphone, for example, we just put almost everything. We just, on, on an average, we use 50 chemical elements that we need to extract from the ground. And they are present within such low concentrations that we are under a millionth of the total for most of them. Which means you don't really recycle anything. As you saw here, most of the thing, whatever is red on the schema, just goes nowhere and anyway as you can see we are barely uh, collecting those waste most of it ends up being incinerated so it's pretty simple the business model of many is based on sales if we stop buying they won't produce and we go back to production based on needs it is very absolutely totally urgent to propose a social economic model that is different where from what we have today where everyone works for themselves against others but actually as we saw against the whole biosphere 80 percent people in developed countries like france do actually mm, change their smartphones while the other one is still working and the flux, the streams um, linked to this global waste, the global e-waste, is already creating tensions and problems between countries and for a reason. Because when, when you're thinking about ecology in high tech, you, you just uh, see this kind of image and very oriented photography, this very positive view. That's why you have in head. But reality, is that that is the image the mental image you have on digital it's clean it's clever it's elegant but it actually relies on the carbon uh, the coal cobalt magnesium indium and tantal economy 
all that is it, it is clear to you that is right now this photo was taken a couple months ago this is it Africa is getting a huge part of waste coming out from Europe and especially France because digital we see that as we perceive it as disposable expendable as the opposite of what it is it is precious it is addictive and doomed so let's see what we can do to not really generate more durable systems we have seen that it is impossible there is not durability in uh in digital but at least uh, be less um, greedy in terms of resources consumptions so i have to tell you um digital responsibility goes much further than the ecology of uh, design uh, of usage of the, the rest you have four essential cards to play they have the negative aspects and the positive aspects those that are intrinsical to whatever is digital and those that are external ecology consists in not wasting these precious assets to to make something out of it that could also be toxic because um designing connected um slippers or connected forks does not bring anything to anyone because spending all your days uh sharing uh, um, conspiracy spam has a cost for everything and everyone and not only social it has a physical cost for everyone you have to pay for everything including ignorance so it's our job to make sure that negative effects go back to zero by making sure that positive effects progress in short you would need to realize you cannot fully decrease your usage of resources but you can have a pretty easy goal of reducing whatever you're going to produce by adopting a lot of solutions and all those solutions could be in the end doing something so first part is what you can do as an individual um, first of all it's all about doing less so whatever i'm going to say now for a couple of slides is going to be do less do less sending do less really storing if you are working anywhere where email is not stored permanently just delete it the problem is it's being sent so don't send it don't use it don't store video image don't do that you can delete everything you need from chats accounts and stuff um you can limit your documents that are shared online um you can limit your file storage you can stop making backups with everything you can just um think that you should reply to one person not to a thousand you should disable notifications you should use bookmarks instead of searching on a search engine uh when you want to find something including on mobile too you can and you have to unsubscribe for everything the newsletters are just dumb um you should remove applications you never use you should um spare your smartphone thanks to that you should um not use automatic cloud upload and synchronization including for all the pictures that you take that are bad they will be synchronized as well every time you take a bad picture if you don't delete it straight away it will be backed up somewhere on the server in the world and used as a data source uh, to analyze your life too so it's part of the business that's why it's free um, you should download things that you need to watch or you want to watch instead of live stream them which is basically um, it's better to have a, um, a temporary backup on a hard disk of a Netflix movie or whatever you want it to be Amazon Prime Disney whatever um, than to just stream it every time you want to watch it because it's optimum and when you just want to rewatch part of it to make your pose whatever it's going to be less data uh, also you shouldn't abuse one to end streaming like twitch like youtube twitch is now the most um uh, consuming and used uh, platform in the world for that you should if you use emails and stuff use very light signatures or none that also works you should um, 
not abuse file uploads and messages. You should limit third party usage for really simple task. You should limit video usage. You don't need to have this when you are video conferencing. You don't need to show your camera. Um, you have to limit and lower everything. You have to use responsible search engines that exist. It's very hard to find because they need data centers and they need to have a business model that brings them money. So at some point, you're going to have to pay or something's going to have to pay up to a limit. You shouldn't print when you have to. You shouldn't abuse paper use. You should use recyclable paper use. Removed all that you don't use on your computer, not on your smartphones too. You should uh, use live shared documents to, con to collaborate, um, even with people as an individual, because it's much better than sending documents through email or whatever. You should be acting as a citizen and have your laws changed. Um, you shouldn't buy, abide by ad-based business model services, which is everything that says my service is free you are the product and it's using this through the use of lots of data centers and servers for no reason but the enrichment of the people owning service so at some point if you're paying for something it's probably better um, and then you're going to realize you are actually having a choice between paying for the services you want to subscribe or realizing that someone is paying for them and they cost millions so that's why most of the services are between five to ten dollars per month. Uh, if you don't know what to do and you're not using, you're not being a superpower user, laptops um, consume like five times more energy between one to five times more energy than desktop computers. So make sure you use them for a good reason. Um, you have energy saving CPUs and architectures. If you don't know what to do, you can ask everyone who can help you. Uh, try not to make videos. You don't need to make videos. You don't need to make live streaming. You don't need to share things all the time. You should, you shouldn't publish ephemeral content. Um, the new things right now is that people post, uh, they are afraid that people won't see them. So they make stories. So they make short videos. So this is a mesh of uselessness. Uh, don't repost or post similar content multiple times. When you have had photos of you, we have seen them. If we wanted to like them or see them, we would have done it. It's done. Don't post the same photographs of you 10 times per day. Uh, in short, think before you do anything online. Think before you even try to reach your smartphone. Um, because also, whatever is crowd audience engagement, uh, like shares, comments, etc., does not define your value. You are a perfect human being if you have zero follower or no social account. Okay, you shouldn't measure them and get a social rank uh, thanks to that. Lots of people who have tens of thousands of followers are actually teenagers right now and they don't have and they don't pretend to have any special values against anyone else. They just live their lives. So don't abuse social media video sharing too. It's actually leading to more replays and a ben bandwidth explosion. Uh, and of course, you need to be careful about digital security because it's going to be an, a growing business, a growing source of revenue for bad people, and it's going to be costing more and more to people trying to prevent it. So it's going to be a business that takes more and more to the planet. Uh, also, if I needed to say so, cryptocurrencies do not exist. They are actually crypto assets. They've been here for over a decade. If they had any use, not a potential use, not a foreseeable use, not a principal use, but a real use, we would know about it. They do not. You can limit your closed bait backups. Uh, you can also think about shutting down your devices when you don't use them. And also you should leave attention economics in the global, which is leaving social network, which is um, deleting your accounts, keeping only one. Um, you don't need more than this. You should actually take greater care of everything, okay, including whatever is being lent to you. If people lent it to you, if you use uh, something that is public just because it's free or someone paid for that or your taxes paid for that, doesn't mean you should treat it as garbage. It is not. It costs a lot, especially to structures. Um, as we say, you can ask for repairable, re recyclable devices. You should estimate your needs. You shouldn't try to buy things too often, too large, too powerful when you don't need them. 
And no, you will not need them, and it's perfectly fine, and you won't be disappointing everyone because you did not. Um, the second-hand market is cool, uh, and you should, uh, before you buy, be aware of whatever you're going to buy, if it's repairable or not. So there you go. And also you should try to make sure everything you're going to use is going to be recycled. Then, as a social being, if you're not moderate what talking, you shouldn't talk at all. So that creates um, very strong discussions and strong discussions online mean more messages, more use, more data. So be careful when you quote specialists. Also, we saw that during the COVID crisis, you should be very careful about what you say, what you see. Um, in short, get to know about science. Anything that is um, knowledge is a better time spent in your life to be a better person. So when you are less ignorant, you are more useful to the world. So if you want to be useful, stop being ignorant. That's hard to do and easy to say, but you can greatly improve that. Uh, just learn how research and science works, uh, learn fundamentals, like we said about energy, matter, chemistry, computing, we just, I gave you a few facts about this. And um, but that's one advice I'm being, I've been giving to people, try to learn about one science fact every week at least, not have it end up down in your inbox, you see, purposely search for one. Okay, that's, that's the difference. Don't subscribe to newsletters that say, I'm reading barely that. No, 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 no. You have to have your mind in a special mood, in a special um, thought process to be searching for that. So, um, also, if you read something that really appears simple and that you like, that it's you're reading anything and say, ooh, that is exactly what I wanted to read. If you say you wanted to read it, you probably have to double check it. It's not going to be a good thing. Then you have to question the sources, including the ones you choose. And of course, um, do not behave when you're outside your home like you wouldn't accept a new own home. So you don't break things, you don't damage things um, anywhere. So uh, you should think about your workplace as much as you think about your personal place. Um, you should live closer to where you work. You should spend more, more time working, less time in transportation. And you, stop, you should stop buying shit hardware. Actually, if we just went to, from three to five years uh, for laptops, you would reduce by 37% in Europe, actually, your greenhouse gas emissions. If you just added one year to the life cycle of smartphones, you would just put minus 25% to 26-7% of greenhouse gas emissions. You would just do the same. Um, if we started all have dual SIM smartphones, one SIM card for work and one for personal conversations and stuff. So, um, in short, if you want to make a quick focus on software development as itself, um, you should learn to conceive, implement, and execute, uh, to design, implement, and execute um, ecologically your application. So, um, when you're speaking about um, public or private structures, you need to find aberrations in products. It's, it's of primary importance, primary relevance, to understand that well be before everything else before you start thinking about economically and ecologically designed stuff uh, the greatest causes of expenses of waste of resources will be for example one in work itself the essence of what we consider as an activity in a world if we just isolate work working is more devastative than um, entertainment Two, the world of work, that is a huge aberration that is costing us more than we think, but we are completely unable to detach from today uh, or, or to just uh, picture it differently because it won. Basically, it won. The, the world of winners has won over the world of dominated people. It just disqualified its opponents by deep-rooted um, mind automations and um, almost unconscious uh, thoughts that you cannot that make you be unable to consider the world in a different 
way than the, the work market, the, the employment market. Uh, three, the structures at themselves. What, what is the use of just try to save 100 grams of uh, CO2 equivalent on an application that you're using uh, arbitrarily? If you're just uh, using also arbitrarily and uselessly a vehicle to go to work when the only justification, the only use of this vehicle is to come back after you use it. That's basically what is about going to work. If your work especially is shit, what you do is take your car, go to work and have a car so that you can come back from work. You see, that's the only use of it. it doesn't have any other use. Fourth, the moon, the world of digital itself um, could be, that's a very rough estimate, could be divided by a hundred in terms of impact. I mean, really. And five, you as an individual, as we just saw, what is the use of reducing the emissions of your applications if when you leave work, everything is still on, the lights are on, the computers are on, and your vehicle is a thermal roadster of 200 horsepower that you pollute with uselessness, uh, social networks with photos of your journeys and trips you do with it on Instagram, whatever, with uh, the brand hashtag to just get promoted. That doesn't have any sense, all right? So um, this is what many polls show when it comes to employee to workers adoption of companies. Um, people today, right now, have in developed countries more sense of affection and more, they, they bring more importance, they attach more importance to the responsibility of the company they work for than they do to working conditions and the working conditions, uh, which means your everyday life at work, is more important than the income. And as you can see, part of the world is changing on the other side. So will you be changing too? And this is tough. In a world of collapsing, of collapsing the money will stop coming in. So when you start firing your employees because of your structural needs, you know you already put on hand the door, the door knob for yourself. When you are dropping people because your income, your yearly income is going down, you know that you already are ready to take out the door and get thrown out yourself and get fired on your turn until everything collapses. So in the meantime, wage increases, will not be on the agenda. Pay everyone uh, equitably and cleverly. And of course, money leeches are out. So if you have shares, buy them back and start keeping your money for yourself. You have 15 years ahead of you, not more. Um, and one of the greatest successes and threats for population of capitalism is the employment market, as we said, where individuals are given the responsibility of selling themselves. Um, this generates pollution, anxiety, uh, suicides, pressure, and blind obedience. Do whatever you can to fight that. Start trusting your employees to pilot your structure along with you. They know more than you think. And make them stay. If they leave, you are also responsible, and this consumes a lot of resources for the planet. And a great step ahead before being able to become a specialist, just add a carbon balance sheet for your own company. See where you are, where the chasms are, and try to include that in your major projects. Not all of them, but the major ones if you can. It's not like an automation, it's just like um, a strategic value added. It seems, if it seems fake and selfless, you will lose. So don't do that. Just do that if it makes sense to you. Um, Visibility on the internet is based on consumption as well. Just like uh, companies that build smartphones requires you to buy smartphones to live, companies that offer visibility through advertising require you to buy, to, to buy ads placement to live. So you have to stop basically social media um, for your company, for your structure. So you will need to advertise less, repost less, post less, strike less, um, advertise less, use less newsletters, use less content, post less content, um, less photos, less videos, less publications. You have to stop what you're doing. That is hard, but yeah. You also have to uh, make sure you maximize remote work, that you get an eco-friendly office, light, lighting, um, 
condition air, uh, the energy efficiency of the structure and everything. You have to take care of that. It's part of your job now. You have to help employees stay at work uh, during pauses so they don't get out because they have nowhere to go, so that they have some place to rest, to breathe, some fresh air. So if they don't feel safe or good, they will leave, they will just go out, they will consume energy because they would sometimes take their cars again, take them transportation again, go to restaurants, go to other places and actually use economy, hence resources where they should be doing something um, less expensive for the planet. So you shouldn't hire distant people if you don't do 100% remote and you should do 100% remote. So if um, you intend to have people coming to your um, office very often, if just not a couple of times, just don't hire them. Um, if you're doing remote working, you're doing remote working. You should help on the other side people park because when they just turn around your buildings because they cannot find a parking place, a parking lot, they will use more oil and they will use less time. So everything is pollution. This is free pollution. And when you say it's not your responsibility, it is. So you have to change that too. Uh, you have, if you have company vehicles to buy eco-friendly ones. Uh, they used to be the case, but then the um, government fundings have stopped in most countries. So people are going back to thermal vehicles now. And you should, of course, reduce, if not stop, all the trips and forget about planes especially. So your employees should not be moving ever again. Because whether you like it or not, at some point, they won't be able to move at all. And you have to review your processes because most of the time they are a resource consumption. Um, you, you ain't going to need any of them. So, yeah. So start looking at what your carbon footprint is and where it comes from, your expenses, um, your life cycle, uh, your um, DHG protocol, um, what it gives, your balance sheet, etc. You have to actually follow recommendations that people can give you if you do that by a third party company. You have to promote public transportation for anything else. You have also responsibility when the weather or the human events conditions are altering the way people can work. Like if there's a, a fair next to you, if there's a heat wave, there's a cold wave, people shouldn't be coming to work. So it's your problem, it's your business, but you are making things worse when you think you are just on your right, okay? And you should also stop off work company meetings. This is just uh, what people call team building, whatever you want to call it. It is just a manager point of view. It doesn't, employees will never ask for that. It, at worst, they will just take more money at the end of a year. They don't care about seeing each other. They don't care about these kind of meetings. It's fun. It's cool, but it's completely three cool. You don't need that. You don't need to have people do that. And of course, um, you should limit data to improve your margins, uh, which is uh, less using uh, data as a way to analyze and create a prism on everything so you can uh, see through this prism uh, the aspects, the facets of your society, of, of, of your company, of your structure. And you should use them and all the resources you have so that the people don't leave your company and don't have to be recruited. All right. And um, also you have to get better material, you have to get better warranties, you have to make sure that when the people who are requiring um, better hardware um, have really been fed up with your hardware so that someone else can maybe reuse it without being fed up. Uh, when it's done, do not throw the old devices to the dustbin. You should give them uh, to the people. Uh, you should um, limit allocation. Not everyone needs a professional smartphone. Uh, only they use it for some reason. You should um, participate into tree conservation projects. This is complicated. You should need to avoid um, carbon equivalent projects, uh, carbon credits and stuff. This is about mostly 
uh, investing part of your income into project and reforestation. The thing is, right now, people are replanting trees that are burning uh, the years after they are planted. So you think like you, ha you are carbon neutral, you cannot and will not be carbon neutral. All right, you have to tell that in your head. You will not be. If, if your company is writing that they are carbon neutral, please leave it right now. They are not. And uh, you should be doing the same, but not only for computer and digital, but for anything that goes around, like material, furniture, the, the chairs, anything. You need to change them as little as you can, so you buy good ones and you keep them. You don't make a promotion of it. You, can, you don't say, hey, we got new office, we got new stuff, we got new um, workstations. Don't promote it, okay? Uh, then you should have Wi-Fi on location. Absolutely, so that people don't use um, mobile networks. This is really important in terms of um, energy use. Um, you should need something that ensures that the health inside the offices is good according to good standards, not to people's taste only. Um, and also you should use eco-friendly hosting partners, whatever it's going to be. And if you can have demoting installations that control the heating and lighting, depending on earth, on visibility, luminosity, it's perfect. And also, uh, as you're also a person working in digital, you should push software updates all the time. You should find an end of line pick up point for your device. You should device de define whatever is going to be a fair use for all of the apps you're using. And uh, you should also... Um, Stop buying corporate com uh, promotion goodies, they are not cool. You should, um, if you're creating apps, you should inform the users that using the apps will have that, that, and that impact on the environment. Um, you should absolutely stop uh, surveys and gathering information about your products. You should uh, fire your marketers, I'm sorry about that. You don't need that. Just make your product good by itself from start. Don't throw anything, say we have um, closed the budget and then see if it works. You cannot do tryouts, you have to succeed now. And computer and IT projects right now are very far away from succeeding. Less than a third of them are actually succeeding right now in the world. And you should remove anything that is not operative expense, which is in the world of computing right now, most of the people are contractualizing things before. And this is absolutely devastating because it costs a lot in human uh, energy, in morale, in uh, well-being, in money, in everything you can calculate. Someone somewhere is getting uh completely ripped off and um stolen so whatever you should conclude now as a contract is that if you need uh, a need of something you say i need that you set up a contract where you sell down what you're going to need or what you're going to sell if you are the one being selling the services and then the people will pay as they use all right, there is no way that you should not have anything else than this. You have whatever you want it to be, but you pay on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis or something, whatever, and uh, it's your problem, all right? And uh, finally, you should, of course, uh, help your relations, your third party, your customers, your... Um, your um the customers you have or the customers you work for everyone you should tell them the same thing you should evangelize the data you should tell them that marketing stuff is consuming you should not uh, aim also at creating dependency for your ecosystems like how is that going to succeed if we create a need if we try to find a need that people do not have that we create and then they cannot get away from us this is very toxic and that's how you create um, new services that add to the stack of pollution so then you have to do anything you want into your company you have to build expertise within your own staff you have to uh, bring information. There's no need to evaluate whatever. You just spread the word. You just take people. 
everyone is willing to understand what I'm speaking right now. Everyone is willing to understand right now in the digital world uh, what I've been trained to do through this conference. And of course, you can share your expertise, your expertise with your partners. It is a good thing if you share what you've been growing through. Okay, so yeah, and of course, use open source software and how it usually costs less. So once again, this doesn't go against your profits. Okay, this is the ecology paradox. It is acting towards saving the energy, the matter, the material, anything. It's going towards savings. It does not go against your profits. But if no one makes any effort, all the profits of everyone will be down. That's the paradox. Either you start acting now as a responsible structure for everyone for the first time in your life. Either you stop it when you don't choose that it will stop along with everyone else. That is the main thing you have to understand from the very beginning. Whatever you say, whatever people will say, there has been no moment when you truly tried to build a structure, a company, anything that's profitable for anything else than yourself. Anyone saying anything different is a liar. For the first time, you're going to have to build a structure that is responsible, willingly, and not only acting on a constraint from the laws or controls or whatever, for the whole humanity. If you want to have an activity that goes over time, you need to be able to see tomorrow. If you don't, you're putting everyone down at the same time. And as we have seen, this is exactly what we're doing right now. You haven't changed a thing. And you think that everyone needs to change at the same time. No, you need to go first. Because the data and AI hype is already a boomer thing. It was a good thing like 10 years ago. We moved to something new and quite critical and much more critical for the business than the rest. Now you should be eco advanced. All right. And the last part, what you can do as digital workers, and then we're done, I swear. Uh, you have to go through eco design, ecological design, which encompasses mainly three aspects the product life cycle assessment, the LCA, which is, as we saw, manufacturing, distribution, installation, use, end of life, as well as considering ecological behavior of stakeholders. Two, you should, uh, you should review product services functionalities, the use, the performance, the level, the duration. And three, you should um, watch the measurement of environmental indicators linked to the product, the service um, used, like natural resources use, water consumption, uh, waste generation, etc. By making sure there's no pollution trade or transfer, like consuming more water uh, despite generating less direct solid waste, for instance. What is the use of polluting on one side if you save on another? It's not good for the planet either. And this applies to us digital workers at all levels. So, eco-design is eliminate the superfluous. The uh, interface should be uh, purified from everything that is nasty and consuming. And also adapting technology. Inco implementation is about optimizing the environment, the runtime environment, is trying to remove whatever is dynamic when it should be static, and also whatever is another head, which is what is what we call um, the digital fat. You see what I mean? The digital fat. Everything we put in software that is just fat, that is ne not necessary to the software. And eco execution, inco. Uh, runtime, ecological runtime, is about optimizing infrastructures, in optimizing architectures, uh, bandwidth, networks, and loading times. But contrary to uh, generic ideas we could have, eco-conceiving does go towards performance, but the opposite is not always truth. You, you, you can imagine very performing, very uh, fast sites like google.com or amazon.com but they have a really weak ecological conceptions despite having very good data center or just like greenpeace said all right it's not the same thing but uh, raw ecologic 
uh, approach has echoes into other good practices like interoperability is a very good thing so you can reuse your systems accessibility uh, eliminates overuse and um, application quality contributes by synergy to make everything rise down gdpr2 don't believe me let's look look at this very sexy hole post 2018 mid 2018 with the number of average http requests per page just after the gdpr was set up in place after may 2019 all right correlation is not a conclusion but i see there's a link between those two things it was really on the rise and then suddenly it stabilized so to sum up if you have come to see this presentation to understand very large technical details of genius that you would have never thought about i'm going to be disappointing you um same thing if, if you thought it wasn't another argument to sell uh on your um on your quotes for your customers less like testing static analysis uh, dynamic analysis agile development uh, security devops etc it is not going to be a cool thing that you have but the rest is actually not either but that's another talk and same you won't make your structures shiny shiny because eco conception eco design is the opposite of a very attractive stuff to put in your commercial offers it is actually how to do less so how not to sell how not to produce to produce um that won't go under your stock pictures that are very bad that pitch in one paragraph how you are very strong about site reliability x ops machine learning or while your onboarding is uh, a super cool turnover of 25 centuries because people are really really good uh, in your company no it's not going to be so eco design as you have understood uh is something that is going to require everyone to get implied if your C level is not able to get implied, you won't venture into those concepts other than hacking your jobs um, as you know uh, submarine behavior, or just by getting away. And spoiler: lots of people are getting away and leaving their jobs. It's getting exploding, and that's that's part of the problem why people cannot recruit properly nowadays. But you haven't you have yet yet i think you have understood that slow tech is not um, a sect it's not um, a, a, a hidden thing to make you go back to stone age or rather to 17th century um, from our era if you want to be precise but um, the idea is to find resonance is to find harmonics into the deep meshes that link our systems um, how to solve the duality into competition that is ruining the world against the social structures that prevent alternatives uh, how to try to persuade um, product owners and people in responsibility under responsibility that um, putting down a nico design version of their information systems have and has to speak now to all the users so they have to as well and how does it work what question do you need to so what how to to orient your thoughts towards your your um skills and stuff how do you get further in what you will find um, details for those measures uh, that are currently under deliberation. Uh, you'll have ideas you'll have good practices through articles and um, repositories each of them contains between 50 to 150 ideas most of them are open source and the ideas are very numerous uh, reading them should take around three hours on an average and depending on the detail they will always have an online presentation if you want to get introduced to them from uh, thinking about the utility the use of functionality to optimizing user uh, journey to um, using service workers or choosing uh, a, a low consumption ecologically responsible hosting uh, from not using non-standard uh, phones to offering uh, a web app instead of a native app everything is into them 
step by step. Don't blame these people. We're just starting uh, the, the, the roadmap. We're just starting the, the, the action, uh, the plan, and this plan is relying on you. So if you think you can be useful, just get implied to uh, and contribute. Uh, there's, I did it. So and I, implied, I, I intend to do it again. There will always be a way to show everyone a stone carved with your name uh, in the great wall that was um, built against the sixth mass extinction. And as I said, um, as uh, digital is the new um, El Dorado, uh, nothing is sustainable. If you look on the top here, um, up to the bottom right, each bar towards the center is a year of duration, and this is chronologically appearing. You see that we are going worse and worse instead of going better and better. Up to a point, food is already lasting more than computer and everything that's digital. In short, you change your smartphone more often than your t-shirt, actually. The thing is, more of the vital, the core materials for digital are already threatened. Just like copper, that is going to be under competition with the, quote, all electric, like electric transportation, new renewable energy, that are going to be completely crazy in terms of competition and orders of magnitude when it comes to using those metals. So for a start, to evaluate a product or a service, you have to see through life cycle. You need resources to be create to, 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 to have it created. We have seen that the cyber world is actually really material. Um, then they have to be processed, they have to be manufactured, distributed and used. And as a name of life, obviously, even your commercial websites, your smartphones, your um, ERPs, your e-commerce website, your Java heavy clients and the 500 pages of um, documentations that still hemp uh, the uh, shelf being right since 1973. Everything has to be going through life cycle assessments. So your only target is that now you should be consuming less of anything else. Equipment use and resources with an equivalent use. Um, so you have to be going towards what is essential on your applications. You shouldn't make equipment um, obsolete. You shouldn't push obsolescence at any cost. We, as you said, we just change 80% of equipment when they are still working perfectly because we find them slow because execution contexts in integrate more and more novelty that is not only useless, but not very productive most of the time. They have more and more overload in terms of um, functional technicity, functionality, technicity, uh, design, strategy. And that's what we call software fat, like I already said. So if you think that the first computer I had, like uh, in 1995, was a Macintosh Performer 5300. Uh, was shipped with 16 megabytes of RAM. The computer I'm speaking to you right now, I'm doing this presentation, has 32 gigabytes, 27 years later. That's on the average 500 times more RAM uh, in 25 years. The, the average web page weight is, is just crazy. It's gone 150 times more in the same period. Except that the use of the epoch of the moment is growing um, straight, straight on our eyes, but the base uses haven't changed. A, a digital character from the basic um, ASCII uh, to emojis, it was 16 bits in UTF-8 in 1995, and it's still 16 bits in UTF-8 in 2022. A form with your first name and your last name posts exactly the same number, same amount of data than it used to 25 years ago. And with its uh, 100 kilobytes of RAM, we have handled Apollo 11 mission. We have landed two people on the moon in 1969. We have brought them back with 35 kilograms of rocks. We don't, we don't even 
we were not even able to make a wall with that it's stupid and that's barely the size of an email today spam email a junk email or any the, anything that looks like the, the the average size of a couple private message in uh, in any private message or direct application messaging application you know so just for emails for example which is the easiest thing to estimate we just estimate between 4 and 30 grams of co2 emitted per each email so there again uh be very careful in the way we estimate these values we estimate that we send 300 billion emails per day and a tree a grown fully grown up tree on the average can absorb 55 grams of co2 per day it's not really good right and that is just email imagine what it would be on direct messaging on any free applications no so, so, so paid by tons of data uh, that is made in hundreds and thousands of data center that imagine vocal messages that, that there are 1000 times heavier and then video messages 10 times more again stored photos that are taken permanently when you know that 95% of the photos taken in the world will never be seen by anyone or at least the person who took them and will never be seeing them again. Imagine then what we could do with direct, with um, augmented reality. You better understand now the way of the digital world. So in short, you cannot create a fully sustainable product or service today but you can have this kind of a timeline if you were honest or dishonest you would change your speech if you are dishonest today you say hey we're going to have a plan for like the 5 10 15 20 years to come 30 years to come we're brilliant and we know we're going to grow and we're going to buy everyone but actually you know everything you know that at some point things are going to collapse we have not been wrong on guessing that we're going to collapse so far and the thing is there is a possible window to build resilience where you can suffer a lot unfortunately just like everyone will do but you can still have a certain amount of activity until maybe your structure becomes something else a public one something that is decided by the citizens you don't know but you have possibilities you have knowledge you have skills people won't trash that we will need that at some point so you can substitute an approach that will be a durable one that will be consuming so little resources that we could neglect it digital is by itself a third of gas emissions that greenhouse gas emissions per year that we could just allow ourselves individually each year so naturally you understand now eco design eco design is about reducing all these negative impacts so you won't be able to go to the ideal position here you won't be able to basically do something that is neutral in terms of effects on the planet and especially you won't be able to do something that is positive very very little things are going to be positive overall which means they are beneficial for the planet as a whole through the life cycle assessments for all resources for all usage more than they consume this has almost no chance to exist right now but we believe one day we could do but maybe how about you just started from nothing to something that is not so bad that could be an optimum that you could reach saying hey we do you know what we did our part all right the global idea would be that there will be nothing else left to make and manufacture smartphones drones watches tvs computers soon and abundant energy is going to be scarce energy there won't be a good digital service so we have to slow everything down we have to oppose to high tech very often badly set up something that we call low tech and we have to approach for a mix of both with what we call slow tech which is from a form of um how to say so uh it would be a form of technology discernment that could be fast but on the condition that it has a purpose 
eco-conception, eco-design through slow tech is not a principle that is only applicable to digital. Like, as opposed to Google Health AI that detects cancers by eating servers, um, this dog on the left is doing exactly the same thing with the same performance for some cancers um, through eating uh, dog food. This is a pe person in United States that propose um, pest uh, pest elimination. You know, through uh, through through using only uh, animals. They're using a mink. Yes, the mink that we have chased for years for its fur. This mink is a very cool uh, pet. You can keep it. It's safe, and you can be trained to kill tens of rats per minute. All right. So slow tech is also moderating your activity online, uh, not going to over tailored uh, stuff that is uh, specifically designed for professional world that you will not be able to follow on yourself. Like hello, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, influencers, YouTubers, whatever new things you are. This is also about perceiving the incredible richness of insects to feed. Um, learning how not to use uh, a digital service to go from point A to point B. But if you are really technophile uh, and you want to just replace PNG files by SVG and SVG by emojis when they exist, it's also valid. Thinking low tech is thinking the world differently. It's thinking uh, and finding um, usage that is performing enough to be acceptable without going towards uh, an exponentially growing use of resources. Uh, I wanted to inclu include the sources, of course, coming from XKCD. I, I, really <laughs> I really think it sums up everything. It really needs some fun sometime. Um, <laughs> I, I just love this. If you, I'll just take the time to read it if you understand what it means. Uh, this is, I think, what sums up um, low tech and slow tech the best. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the spirit. That's the idea. More simply put, to conclude, uh, to sum up, digital conception and eco conception, eco design, you must learn to do nothing again. To spend an hour without connection to walk or just stop to take the time to sit down without meditating or any esoteric bullshit just to even not have to take a, a bike just find the time again to perceive time instead of counting it and finally if you want to go further because i went way too fast tonight um i advise you to go towards your new adventures these one are the French one, but the um, most of them have videos that are automatically subtitled by YouTube. So if you go to see their conferences, you will have uh, English subtitles. Uh, I have playlists on my YouTube account with them. But if you need English speaking people, you have lots and lots of them. Brilliant and truly passionate people. That's just absolutely crazy. And you have also organizations that are used as sources for this presentation. Um, and a lot of them uh, that you can find those are again uh, the French one, but you can find uh, not, not only French one, this one is not a French one, but you can find um, lots of information all these ones. And um, to finish that long sprint, I wanted to share a birth, uh, the one of the workshop that I created uh, in the long line of the French rescues, um, citizen based, uh, collective intelligence based workshops for citizens. Um, this one lasts three hours and three hours and a half. Uh, I can do it for up to 20 people at a time by groups of six to nine. If you want to go further, uh, it just goes over what we have seen today, except for the digital part. We've let's let's say way more details. Um, and uh, this workshop, uh, that is a global understanding workshop, uh, is something that can be complemented through extensions that. Um, lengthen it between 30 60 minutes more and to ex better extend its contents and the first extension just out and it's good because it's about digital and electronics so 
it makes a whole workshop uh, last about four, four hours to four hours and a half. But really, I promise it's worth it. Uh, all the all the information is online. Um, and of course, uh, self promotion, shameless self promotion. You will just kill me in public for that. Um, I propose to watch my conference in English French to understand that with more details. It's perfectly boring, I swear. It's uh, a little less than seven hours, but actually seven hours is just like a, a series to binge watch. Uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking about way more topics like economic aspects, um, digital resistance, ethics, social, digital, and epistemology and stuff. Um, I'm probably going to do more soon and uh, speak about that. So I'll let the link to the seven hours conference and digital responsibility. You will find that on YouTube anyway. And to conclude, you can actually be under the minimum wage with no capital and say, I'm a fucking billionaire. You can go 150 kilometers per hour blindfolded in your car on the, on the highway and yell, I will not crash. You can be late and say, no problem, I'll just teleport. You can be made of atoms and say, ah, pff, actually, atoms don't matter. Uh, with a little joke here. Um, you can say, I need an even number and say, all right, I'm going to pick 137. That's a perfect even number. You can fly around the Earth and say, Earth is flat. You can also live like we do today and say, this will last forever. You see? If you are worrying about whether humanity will collapse or not. It has already collapsed at some very precise point. So we already have traces, uh, memories of places and locations on Earth where human people have disappeared without any explanation for that. So to conclude, we are facing a society choice. Whatever happens, Everything is going down very fast. So we have to choose. If we want to uh, keep our fragility, uh, the exertion of resources, our vulnerability, and have everything collapsed under our eyes, or go for another choice, the one of resistance to the actual world, the current world, of purposely willed and chosen sobriety, of a world of resiliency when you can just organize resilience and your ability to come back after a hit and to anticipate it the world of not recession but degrowth it's a very complex world that is very close to greenwashing already so now i have to say thank you for your patience thank you for this marathon thank you i hope you have understood the essential of what i wanted to say Knowing that the important thing is to act quickly, and act quickly means um, everyone has to take care of the problem, everyone has to um, understand it. So I'm telling on you not only to diffuse and to broadcast and to share this. If you don't want to share my work, I don't care, it's fine. Just share whatever you think is good, but talk about everything to the people around you. And now you have understood that we have a definitive choice. Defense or defiance, uh, soothing or exhausting, um, and extinguishing or just extinction from the one who shares this planet and this beautiful starlit sky with you. I thank you deeply, and now it's your son. Thank you. <laughs>